The mentor. Don't give yourself so much stress. The cheerleader. You know, it's very difficult as beginning. So you can start building greatness. Our goal is to build music. Ten days later, we will release a demo on our website. Time is very tight. So you can see the world differently. So you can feel its pain and want to change it. So you can make a difference every day. Not through words alone. But the small steps. Not for the fame. But for the world. Because you have always been special. And because this is where you get pushed to your limits. This is how you can teach through the internet, through the training center, to achieve the first ascent. This time, I'm going to race. Come on, come on. Let's see. Yeah. Next, I ask you. 使劲去想象守护运动。You can be spectacular。我们把这些信息全部采集和记录下来。And you can live every possibility。What if this is your chance to greatness？ 一定能够通过自己的努力考上一所理想的大学，能不能做到？ Would you choose？ To experience this. A letter long awaited, upon which dreams are built. Father, mother, you have some things. And the joy is heartfelt. If this is a sign of new beginnings.
and a chance to make a difference. How will you begin? Hey, this is. 因为七十二岁的一个高位截瘫病人，一起来完成一个精度比较高的三维脑控这么一个研究。With boldness and imagination. 大家好，我是新来的李老师。Or riddled with a fear of failure. Being in a new place can be overwhelming. 我问一下各位啊，你们为什么要学这个学科 ？I have to remember a lot of things, and plus I have many subjects. What should I do? 老师，我今后到底应该往什么样的方向去发展 ？Making a difference isn't easy. 考古可以这么高科技吗 ？Trusting your very first choice and keeping at it is tough. 比较多的障碍，并不是说我我考了你们所有人，全国已经找不到比海南更好的人了，尽可能做到尝试。But like the hundreds of thousands of people who have come through these doors. You can overcome them all because this isn't just any other destination. This is the home of the can-do spirit. 你看啊，这个扫描完了以后呢，就会出现整个这石窟三维模型。你这不光是形制，你有颜色，这个我们以前的考古记录是做不到的。The incubator. Of fresh beginnings. 除了这个专业学科以外，你还要去攻读更多的学科，这样才能开阔自己的眼界，做更好的科研。The motivator. 金爽，哎，学长，好久不见了，好久不见，天哪，我考上浙大了，太好了。The mentor. Don't give yourself so much stress. The cheerleader. You know it's very difficult at the beginning. So you can start building greatness. Our goal is to make music. Ten days later, we will show you a website demo. Time is very tight. So you can see the world differently. You have a new direction, a new future. Stop! 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 So you can feel its pain and want to change it. So you can make a difference every day. Not through words alone. But the small steps. Not for the fame. Because you have always been special, and because this is where you get pushed to your limits. This is how it works. It can be sent through the internet to the Earth Center, which is now the Earth Center. 这次应该跑通了，快快快，来看一下啊！耶！下面请你使劲去想象守护运动。You can be spectacular。我们把这些信息全部采集和记录下来。And you can live every possibility。What if this is your chance to greatness？ 一定能够通过自己的努力考上一所理想的大学，能不能做到？ Would you choose to experience this?
回忙，我拿着录取通知书了。啊，浙江大学。A letter long awaited, upon which dreams are built. 老爸老妈，给你们看看东西。And the joy is heartfelt. If this is a sign of new beginnings and a chance to make a difference, how will you begin? Hey, Chen Shi, because he's seventy-two years old, he's got a high-level blood clot disease. Let's come together to complete a high-level blood clot disease research. With boldness and imagination. Hello, I'm Li Teacher. With boldness and imagination. Hello, I'm Li Teacher. With boldness and imagination. Hello, I'm Li Teacher. With boldness and imagination. Being in a new place can be overwhelming. I ask you, why do you want to study this course? You have to remember a lot of things, and plus, I have many subjects. So what should I do? Master, what should I do in the future? Making a difference isn't easy. Trusting your very first choice and keeping at it is tough. 比如说我我考虑你们所有人全部一起找不到比海南更好的人了，尽可能做到极致。But <音> 看这个扫描完了以后呢，就会出现整个这石窟三维模型。你就不光是形制，你有颜色，这个我们以前的考古记录是做不到的。The incubator of fresh beginnings. 除了这个专业学科以外，你还要学更多、更多的学科，这样才能开阔自己的眼界，做更好的科研。The motivator. 金爽，哎，学长。The mentor. Don't give yourself so much stress. The cheerleader. You know it's very difficult at the beginning. So you can start building greatness. Our goal is to create music. Ten days later, we will release a demo on our website. Time is very tight. So you can see the world differently. 有了新的学术方向，新的未来。别再停！喂，还在有，还在有。喂，喂妈，你们那边还好吧 ？So you can feel its pain and want to change it. So you can make a difference every day. 家长，你想想看，把这个手往。The role of universities in the 2030 agenda. Uh, my name is Li Ming. I'm the uh, director of the Office of Global Engagement at Zhejiang University. So I will be moderating the opening of this forum. And uh, my colleagues from IAU, from Zhejiang University, and also Eindhoven University of Technology will lead the panel sessions. And we are very happy to be joined by honorable guests from United Nations, UNESCO, IAU and partner universities. We also have many listeners from, from around the world. Thank you all for being with us virtually in this dialogue. For the opening part, our first speaker is Professor Wu Zhaohui, President of Zhejiang University. Let's welcome Professor Wu. Students, colleagues, and friends, it is a pleasure to welcome you all to the forum on the role of the university in the 2030 agenda. Where I could not meet in person due to COVID-19, I am happy to be part of a meaningful conversation, united for, by our shared commitment. Thank you very much for joining us, and many thanks to IAU for your support to the event. In, 19, in 2019, the UN called 
on the own select of uh, society to mobilize for the adequate and action on the three levels. They are global action, local action, and uh, people action. We are less than 10 years to go, and uh, with the pandemic slowing of uh, progress, the world is now standing at a critical moment to deliver on the 2030 agenda. I believe that this is why our meeting today is so important. As a symbol of uh, what we uh, value, as a goal for those who have not to set out on the path, and as a source of uh, support for those trying to upgrade their effort. Our forum will be covered three, three pieces. Education for the sustainable future, advancing scientific cooperation, and collecting a greener campus. Through these sections, we aim to highlight the core ideas of sustainable development, which required us, first of all, it be to be the human oriented, the well rounded development of the mankind is both the end of the goals of a sustainable development and an important resource source of the strategic. So, the education should play the fundamental role in realizing our vision for the, the better world. Secondly, to be innovation driven, a society would not develop for the long without the people advancing the frontier of the knowledge, discovery, research, and innovation have been proved to be the key to the new solution. And finally, to, to be down to the earth, a university campus with, is a smaller community. If we want to change the world, we must start with ourselves, with all aspects of our everyday operations. The world is now complex than it used to be and uh, is complicated by the pandemic. However, we gained much confidence from the recent vaccines rolled out, the most rapid one in the history. It is a clear example of uh, international cooperation, technical empowerment, and the importance of uh, education in fighting the disinformation. Like COVID-19s, every SDG requires a joint effort, close disassemblies, regions and natures, where we are, as in an innovation-driven university, has a greater responsibilities on our shoulders we also have unique and the role to play in the 2030 agenda. For centuries, uni universities have been at the heart of uh, social and uh, cultural transformations. Just as the fourth industrial revolution we are going through now, it has catalyzed a new technologies, including mobile in internet, big data, and uh, artificial intelligence, reshaped the ways people work and live, and uh, brought new dynamics to the world. In this context, innovation-driven university can fairly unleash 
than unique stresses in the following aspects. In time of our education, we can work to improve SDG compatibility by the empowering our students, staff, and the general public with the motivation and the knowledge and the skills to understand and address the SDGs. In this process, we need to firstly harness the power of technology to extend people access to quality education. In terms of the research, we can drive out our rich academic ecosystem to support scientific cooperation <coughs> and the knowledge transfer closer to these disciplines. Uh, interdisciplinary and uh, conventionalist research should be encouraged in order to address the SDG for us both technical and uh, policy making perspective. In terms of uh, particip partnership, we can act as the central hub to combine strategies strategies link the global and the local and to promote cooperation among multiple shaking holders. Behind our partnership, open science should be embraced as a general principle to facilitate their cooperation. Like you universities, Zhejiang firmly uphold sustainable development and think to make world a better place where perceive innovation uh, excellences. I, we have uh, launched an action plan, plan named a group ZGU for social goals or Z4G in short. When implementation this plan, we do it together with our partner, learn from each other and make mature progress. Taking this opportunity, we are happy to join the force with 15 four peer university follow from 10 nine countries and regions to make the joint statement on the 2030 agenda. I would like to thank all the university leader for your kind support. The statement is to express our collective commitment to the SDGs. We also hope it will be a strong call for the action to the global higher education community, community and beyond. With that, I would look like to conclude, conclude my remark. I look forward to listening to other speakers and to our uh, group participates during these discussions. I wish you good health and hope we, have, we will be able to welcome you in Hanzhou in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Wu. Thank you very much. Now, uh, may I have the uh, privilege to introduce to you His Excellency, Mr. Nick Seth, the United Nations Assistant Secretary General. Mr. Seth will share his insights about the Agenda 2030. Uh, President Wu, dear participants, greetings from Geneva. I had the pleasure of meeting Professor Wu and Ms. Lee Wynn in Geneva. It was a great uh, meeting and Thank you for inviting me for this forum. Past year has been a disaster for everyone, for every university, for every individual, organization, and institution. COVID-19 has served as a reminder of our interdependence. And interdependence has opportunities, of course, but there are severe challenges. Last year has also shed light on a whole series of pre-existing conditions not pre-existing health conditions alone, but pre-existing societal conditions from inequality 
to in rampant environmental destruction, to political uh, problems. And yet, the opportunity and willingness to collaborate, create partnership, and enhance collective action is increasing. Despite the circumstances, the discourse and action on creating progress towards achieving the SDGs is evident everywhere. Of course, the SDGs have received a severe setback, but we are all hoping that the setbacks will reinforce our determination that the SDGs remain a blueprint for a prosperous and sustainable world. The organization I head, UNITAR, uh, focuses a lot on the SDGs and for scaling up innovation for the SDGs. We support, implement, and improve innovation and practices that can produce critical skills and training to meet today's needs. I want to mention two things of what we do because uh, I think it will be useful to the other people in academia present here. We support something called the University Global Coalition, which brings more than 150 universities, academia, researchers, and students from the United States, from Canada, from Latin America, Africa, Asia, and Europe in a very diverse learning environment. We also host the SDG Learn Platform last year has had more than 60,000 learners which, who have used the learning platform. And of course, the twin of the SDG learning platform is the climate change learning platform. And I have the pleasure of giving the 100,000th certificate of completion to a young student from Brazil. 300,000 plus people have benefited from this particular platform. There are some features that can enable learners of today to become change agents to supporting the SDGs. First is collaboration and the increasing evidence of greater collaboration, especially among universities. Action propelled by new ideas and approaches, greater cross-border collaboration, and some of it in today's meeting is evidence of this, creating ethical mindsets, and a new sense of great urgency in this era that we are living in. And of course, it's not only the SDGs, but the twin, as I mentioned, addressing climate change, both the mitigation and adaptation are extremely urgent needs of our world. During this decade of action, after all, 2030 is not that far away. There is a particular urgency to make progress on youth mobilization innovations for our ecosystem and with new technologies and digital skills and creating professional opportunities for sustainable development. Now the SDGs themselves cover a large number of goals, 17, a large number of targets, but I want to reduce this to a set of transformations that the SDGs address and the world urgently needs. And in as a consequence of this focus, I think universities in all aspects of their work, as you said, Professor uh, Wu, in the area of education, research and partnerships, I think universities need to focus greatly on. The first systems with a focus on universal health coverage, publicly funded, especially focusing on the most distressed and the most vulnerable. Whatever it takes to get to universe, uh, universal health coverage, particularly in the poorest countries, is one of the most important transformations that the world needs. Second is the transformation of the energy systems with a focus on renewables and efficiency and access to all of modern energy systems. The third is transformation of our food systems to tackle starvation, hunger, obesity, micronutrient deficiency, essentially through sustainable farming at scale with better management of water, increasing use of organic fertilizer. The food industry needs a complete overhaul. And apart from the massive increase in the number of people who are entering back into abject poverty, 
One estimate from the World Bank says 150 million people have slipped back into abject poverty. World hunger is also on increase. So addressing the millions of farm systems that the world has, we must address this as a matter of urgency. The fourth is transformation of the finance industry and everything which comes under the rubric of the finance industry, banks as it to pursue green pathways in their entire operations. Finally, the transformation of education systems with better pedagogical and methodological approaches, building on the success of the social media and the gaming industry. We have the technology now to reach millions at very low cost. Of course, it means a lot for universities to rethink their revenue models, but we have the potential now of reaching people, not in the tens of thousands, but in the millions. Let us educate and uh, energize our world to make intelligent decisions. Climate change will give us even greater shocks and aftershocks, more than we can imagine today. But these five transitions that I mentioned will be the minimum insurance for a sustainable future. It is in these thematic areas that I would love to see greater action from universities and academia. I wish you a fruitful discussions and look forward to the recommendations from today's meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Seth. We all believe that collaboration and also multilateralism is one of the very important answers to those urgent calls of global development. So thank you again. And uh, let's welcome our next speaker, Ms. Stefania Giannini, Assistant Director General for Education, UNESCO, please. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to attend the International Forum on the Role of Universities in the 2030 Agenda, organized by the Chenjiang University in collaboration with the International Association of Universities. Well, at the outset, allow me to take this opportunity to congratulate you on the convening of the forum, quite timely. This initiative demonstrates the vision of a mission-led higher education institution in seeking truth and pursuing innovation, as embodied in the motto of the Jaipur University. It's also an honor for me to join the leaders of universities from across the world present today and our key partner, the International Association of Universities. While your presence reflects the conviction the same I have, that universities have a frontline role to play in achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. For the first time in history, an international development agenda recognized the strategic role of higher education. SDG 4 calls for equal access for all women and men to affordable and quality technical, vocational, and tertiary education, including universities and for the promotion of lifelong learning opportunities for all. And it's a big change. Beyond this, the 17 SDGs represent an agenda for research and intellectual collaboration geared towards the common good. Indeed, sustainable transformation and inclusive growth are not possible without an innovative tertiary education system. The extent to which institutions geared their programs to the sustainable development agenda will be critical for ensuring that graduates are equipped to shape the future. While university must become incubators of societal transformation, research in the sciences and the humanities is fundamental to designing ethical and evidence-based solutions, whether to respond to climate change, to improve health and well-being, to alleviate poverty and unlock innovations that set up societies on a more sustainable course. This is all the more pressing today as humanity faces a global public health crisis that could roll back decades of gains in human development, including in education. Universities have been at the forefront of scientific research to develop a vaccine, we know. 
analyze the patterns and impact of the pandemic and provide evidence to inform policy making. This response, well, this response reflects the critical nexus between research, policy and society. It speaks to the importance of transdisciplinary approaches of joint research of more open science and better access to knowledge and scientific capacity in low and middle income countries. It's very much about science and society. And the only UN agency with a mandate in higher education, UNESCO of course, has played a, dec a decisive role over the past decades in promoting this kind of intellectual collaboration in research, in facilitating the mobility of students and faculty and recognizing their qualifications across the borders. On the normative front, let me recall an important project initiative we launched uh, uh, two years ago now, the Global Convention on the Recognition of Qualifications Concerning Higher Education. It's been approved by Member States at the General Conference in 2019, and this is the very first United Nations Treaty on Higher Education with a global scope. This is a milestone in the democratization of knowledge. The implementation of the convention rests with each of you present here and universities across the globe to facilitate academic mobility, improve access, and promote quality higher education for all. And this is a bit the, the historical mission that university have actually in history. We, we are also leading a global consultation to develop a recommendation on open science as a game changer, as a game changer to promote a free and open access to knowledge, scientific data, and networks. Our network of UNESCO chairs, a very well known to all of you, is geared towards mobilizing expertise and knowledge sharing to advance the sustainable development agenda. Now, nowadays, uh, we count on more than uh, 800 chairs and cooperation across uh, more than 100 countries. It's, it's incredibly, it's, it's a huge and unique uh, treasure we have in our hands. And I'm glad that we have shareholders present at the, at the forum today, you know, including the UNESCO chair in uh, entrepreneurial education at uh, Zhenjiang University. Higher education, uh, well, faces the double challenge of responding to this unprecedented uh, learning disruption and strengthening its capacity to take forward uh, the agenda to shape a more just and equitable post-pandemic world. It's about building back that, as you say many times. Well, you know, UNESCO estimi estimates uh, that 7 million uh, students, uh, more or less, are today at risk of not pursuing their tertiary education studies because of the pandemic's impact, of the, of the, of the, of the economic impact of the, of the crisis, of course. International students have been uh, uh, stranded, so to say, despite commendable efforts to offset the, the, the disruption, uh, to face the challenge uh, in every country. Uh, students uh, are still struggling with access to remote learning, uh, social isolation, and of course, economic strife. Educational research budgets are at risk of being out. A key, uh, a crucial factor, a key factor in the equation of building back more resilient uh, to, uh, to harness digital uh, technologies for inclusion and to strengthen recognition of qualifications obtained through online provision. Well, as it concerns uh, equity uh, and inclusion, uh, uh, being at the center of UNESCO response uh, to the global pandemic, let me say that the establishment of the Global Education Coalition uh, under UNESCO leadership provides a very important, unique platform for cooperation exchange to protect the right to education. To date, more than 170 members uh, from the UN family, civil society, private sector, of course, uh, universities uh, have joined forces to support countries uh, uh, through the coalition uh, to develop uh, inclusive remote learning solutions at all levels. 
And the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we know, unfortunately, uh, it has only accelerated the urgency of global cooperation around access to learning, research and knowledge in the digital age. It calls now for an inclusive and connected global higher education community supporting the 2030 agenda and beyond the horizon of 2030. The third World Higher Education Conference to be held uh, from 7 to uh, 9 uh, October this year in Barcelona, Spain, uh, will contribute to this ambition. It will bring together all stakeholders to collectively define a kind of roadmap to 2030 and beyond 2030 for uh, what we can say an inclusive and social responsible higher education that crucially contributes to the global common. I'm clearly looking forward to your participation in the conference, uh, your discussions today with the three sessions uh, uh, on education, scientific collaboration and the sustainable campus, I'm sure mark an important contribution to that task. I wish you a very fruitful discussion and looking forward to working jointly with you to offer a promising and uh, humanistic vision for the future of high education and universities all over the world. I thank you very much. Shishi. Thank you, Ms. Giannini. Thank you very much. Daja, how? We all know that UNESCO has been playing a very important role in promoting intellectual collaboration. And as you mentioned, that Zhejiang University also has been the chair of the UNESCO Innovation and Entrepreneurship Education. And we do look forward to working with UNESCO and our partner universities to make our endeavors to bridge science and society. Thank you. Now next, I would like to invite Professor Peter Salovey, President of Yale University, to give us a speech. Let's welcome President Salovey. Daja Hao. Hello, I'm Peter Salovey, President of Yale University. Thank you for inviting me to join you for this virtual international forum on the role of universities in 2030. I am honored to contribute to this discussion with such esteemed colleagues from around the globe. As some of you know, Yale is a co-host of the US chapter of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. In cooperation with colleagues from all parts of the world, Yale's faculty are drawing from their areas of expertise to address the challenges posed by climate and environmental change. For example, the Yale Schools of Architecture and of the Environment partnered with the United Nations Environment Program to construct a tiny house from locally sourced bio-based renewable materials. They installed this house on the UN Plaza. Their work demonstrates the potential of sustainable design as a solution to poverty and environmental degradation. At Yale, we are working across sectors and disciplines to safeguard our planet for future generations. Planetary solutions is one of the top five areas for scientific investment at Yale and it is an area of focus across the university, from engineering to law, from economics to public health. Now, you are all familiar with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. These apply to developed as well as developing countries. They are comprehensive and serve as a platform for collective action in addressing global challenges. At Yale, we did a review of over 4,000 faculty members to determine how our teaching and research connect to each of the goals. Every academic department or school at Yale has at least one faculty member whose scholarship relates to the SDGs. Our teaching and research also connect to each SDG. Some of our key strengths are SDG 3, good health and well-being, SDG 4, quality education, SDG 10, reduce inequalities, and SDG 17, peace and justice. As you can see at Yale, we're committed to contributing actively to putting our society on a more sustainable trajectory. 
And we not only support groundbreaking research in this area, we also have a long history of preparing students to work across sectors to solve major challenges. For example, in 2018, William Nordhaus, a Yale alumnus and Yale Sterling professor of economics, was awarded the Nobel Prize in economics for transforming our understanding of the costs of environmental degradation and climate change. Other Yale graduates are at the helm of governments, businesses, nonprofit organizations, and research enterprises with environmental and social foci. Our enduring commitment to finding solutions to climate change extends beyond research and education. We also apply the research findings of our faculty members to university operations. Through careful stewardship, we have reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 43% over the past 15 years, even though our campus square footage has increased by about 21%. We achieved this significant reduction by establishing strict guidelines for building design, renovation, and maintenance. We invested in our on-campus power plants and improved our energy infrastructure. We installed renewable energy technologies and set requirements for efficient vehicles. We also launched a carbon charge program in 2015 based on the ideas and suggestions of Professor Nordhaus. This initiative is among the first of its kind in higher education. Putting a price on carbon could be a powerful incentive to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now in place across our campus, Yale's Carbon Charge Initiative works by billing each administrative unit within the university for its building-related carbon emissions. Our work in research, teaching, and practice is a down payment on what we owe future generations. Our efforts demonstrate not only the power of scholarship, but also collaboration and a dedication to the common good. Regardless of the challenges we face in our own communities, scholars around the world are connected through the creation and sharing of knowledge to build and sustain a thriving society. That certainly gives me hope for 2030 and beyond. Cheshire. Thank you, President Salovey. And thank you very much for sharing with us the uh, enduring commitment and also your, uh, the best practices of your university in regard to sustainability. And uh, for the opening part, our last speaker is Professor Pan Fredman. Uh, President of International Association of Universities. Professor Fredman, please. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure as the President and on behalf of the International Association of Universities, IAU, to welcome you all to this joint online um, event with Zhejiang University, the Global University Presidents Forum. Two years ago, we should, would still have been seeing the pandemic as a global challenge to which we should be prepared to meet. The target 3B in the SDG 3, good health and well-being, calls to support the research and development of vaccines and medicines for the communicable and non-communicable diseases. It is at an unpredictable speed that basic and applied research has triggered closer cooperation between universities and with pharmaceutical companies in several countries, which has resulted in the provision of a number of vaccines. The speed with which the vaccine came to the market is a result of urgency, but without knowledge created through higher education research and competence, this would not have been possible. Society should strive to generate knowledge that will allow to leave no one behind. As stated by the UN Agenda 2030, transforming our future, universities and other higher education institutions ought to play a key role by engaging with the SDGs to create and develop the kind of knowledge acquired to address these and to share with its society. 
higher education institutions are, as said several times now, key actors in the education ecosystem. They, they equip a future generation with knowledge and understanding of global and local challenges and with the competence required to leverage on opportunities. They are to take actions and foster sustainable development. So cooperation and cohesion among higher education institutions and organizations will foster knowledge development and sharing. Higher education and higher education cooperation hence need to be promoted and advocated for to policy and decision makers. As well, awareness and understanding of the fundamental principles upon which to develop quality higher education need to be increased in order for the sector to fulfill its unique role in research and education and in society at large. The International Association of Universities, IAU, was called into life by and is an official partner of UNESCO. And last year, uh, IAU celebrated its 70th anniversary as the Global Network and Voice for Higher Education uh, organizations. IAU promotes and advocates for higher education and the focus uh, specifically on fair, inclusive and meaningful internationalization higher education for sustainability, digital transformation on higher education, and value-based leadership. IU is a membership-based organization serving the global higher education community through expertise and trend analysis, publications and portals, advisory services, peer-to-peer -peer learning events, and global advocacy and cooperation and cohesion in higher education has and is leading IAU activities. So the COVID-19 pandemic has brought awareness to the global challenges that end the interconnection between the SDGs. The higher, ed higher education sector was immediately affected, campuses were closed, education when possible was piloted online, so did research and international conferences. There are short and long-term consequences on higher education, such as risk of increasing inequality, mobility restrictions, reduced financing, but there are also opportunities. These were the results in the IAU Global Survey, which was performed in the start of the pandemic. The second survey is now open for all higher education institutions, and we hope that you will take part the deadline is 15th of April, April, because the results aims to help institutions benchmark themselves at global, regional, and national level, to provide accurate data to national authorities for policy development, and not the least, the aim form to the third UNESCO World Higher Education Conference, which was recently mentioned, which will be in October this year. So, in conclusion, Global networking and cooperation are the basis upon which higher education can thrive and fulfill its societal role for a sustainable future. Knowledge should leave no one behind. Thank you for this attention. And also I wish us all a very fruitful and relevant discussion for the hours to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fredman. And we all believe that higher education institutions have a more important role to play in addressing those grand challenges and leveraging each other's strengths as well as the opportunities. Thank you very much. So before we start the panel, I would like to remind all the speakers to keep, please keep your microphones on mute unless you are presenting and also please keep timing of your speech. All the participants, can you use the uh, Q&A option at the bottom of your screen to post your questions? And the end of each session, the moderators will ask a couple questions on your behalf. So we will start the first panel. It will be moderated by Dr. Eliji Van Land, Secretary General of IAU. Dr. Van Land, I give the floor to you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to speak after this esteemed panel uh, and thank you very much for actually hosting this very important forum today. As you've just heard from uh, Pam Fredman, the IAU president, the IAU is not only pleased to support this conference because we are so much working on sustainable development, something we do since the early 1990s, um, it is part and parcel of our vision and mission to actually uh, trigger and foster higher education cooperation around the globe to uh, foster transformative higher education for the future. And so I'm very pleased to be here at this very conference also to uh, partner with a very important member University of the IAU. You've been, uh, Zhejiang University has been a member of the IAU for more than 13 years now. And we've had the opportunity to exchange on many topics along the way. And we are very pleased here to celebrate uh, the importance of the role of higher education in fostering a sustainable future. So thank you very much for that. And uh, without further ado, we have 35 minutes. And I say this to also help my, my panelists to, uh, to think about time when addressing the issues. Uh, I'm very pleased to open up to this first session on educating for a sustainable future with speakers from the UK, from Australia, from France and uh, from the US. And it is uh, wonderful to see that this is possible thanks to uh, the, the digital uh, pivoting of our events uh, nowadays. Uh, obviously, it would have been much nicer to meet all together face to face and to exchange uh, even beyond the limits of our session. But this is already a very good start to exchange on such very important topics. I see many other members in the room as well, and I salute them here. Uh, pleased to be uh, together, at least to um, debate such an important topic today. So I will start and invite um, Michael Spence, the president and provost of the University College London, to address the panel. And I saw from uh, your, your previous um, work that you indeed stressed the um, importance of universities as being so uniquely placed to foster sustainable development. And you will present on how this translates at the level of um, the University College London. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, as President and Provost of University College London, London's Global University, it is my honour to participate in this Global University President's Forum. Our institutional partnership with Jajang Dasre is hugely important to us here at UCL, and I believe the work that our academics and students are doing together is, is making a real difference to people's lives. Well, here at UCL, with more than 13,000 staff and 42,000 students from 150 different countries, we believe that through co-creating wise solutions to global problems and actively involving our students in the process, we can deliver the biggest impact. And that's precisely the approach that ZJU and UCL have taken in developing our partnership from, from bottom-up academic engagement right across a range of disciplinary areas. Addressing the challenges facing society was at the heart of UCL's founding mission in 1826, and to this day, we continue to bring together the brightest minds across different disciplines to tackle pressing issues from COVID to climate change. The UN Sustainable Development Goals frame what are inevitably multidisciplinary complex problems. And as London's leading multidisciplinary university, UCL academics and students are well placed to respond in a meaningful way. Well, 2021 feels like a watershed moment for the world in our efforts to create a more sustainable and equitable future for everyone. So the topic of this panel, educating for a sustainable future, seems particularly pertinent for the time in which we find ourselves. Both the pandemic and the climate crisis have been shown disproportionately to affect the poorest and most marginalised people in society, such as migrants and refugee populations. Universities have a duty to respond by acknowledging the complex challenges we all face and by encouraging debate, innovation and deeper engagement with local communities, ultimately to co-create vital solutions through collaboration. Last year, I was pleased to speak at UCL's Beyond Boundaries conference, which examined why and how universities should address the SDGs. In my opinion, it's only through cultural and systemic change in how we approach the SDGs that we can ever hope to achieve them. 
For universities, engaging our undergraduates and early career researchers as active citizens is crucial. They should be offered the opportunity to engage with the SDGs critically through research and teaching across all areas, co-designing innovative solutions. Universities are uniquely well-placed to help educate this next generation of researchers, entrepreneurs, and policymakers who will go on to achieve the goals. Our spaces can be vital incubators for new ideas and collaboration. At UCL, sustainability is at the heart of the way we operate. From our education and research to our campus and community, we're committed to building on UCL's progressive history, positive impact, and disruptive spirit. In education, to ensure we put into practice what we preach in this area, we're incorporating sustainability into all our teaching across all our faculties. Whether it's studying climate change from the perspectives of English literature or physics and astronomy, or our virtual masters in development education and global learning, in which students can study a range of perspectives and approaches to development education, global learning, and global citizenship. Outside the lecture theatre, we're also empowering our students to get involved in activities that are supporting the SDGs. Some notable examples include redistributing surplus meals to tackle food poverty in London and organising workshops to help London school children understand the causes and consequences of the climate emergency. But it's not only in educating our student body where we can make a difference in sustainability. We know that bringing together diverse perspectives accelerates this process of discovery. By uniting experts in a particular field, unrestricted by where they happen to be in the world, the best minds can work together to explore solutions to problems that span conventional borders. For example, as soon as COVID struck, UCL academics were front and centre of the UK's response to the disease, seeking first and foremost to save lives here as well as overseas. UCL healthcare engineers developed in record time a low-cost breathing aid in collaboration with UCLH clinicians and Mercedes, which is helping to reduce the number of deaths caused by the virus in hospitals around the world. They made the instructions required to manufacture the device freely available online. And I'm delighted to say that it's since been supplied to around 130 hospitals in the UK and is in use in at least 15 other countries. When I joined UCL this year, I was amazed to find that thousands of our students, staff and our alumni are already undertaking activity that is helping to address the SDGs at local, national and global levels. Over the past five years, UCL published around 30,000 SDG-related research papers, many of them with partners in the UK and around the world. These range from improving sanitation in urban Africa to generating electricity from food waste in a London community garden next door to our campus in central London, to our historians supporting a sustainable approach to heritage in post-conflict Iraq. Most of this activity involves engaging with local communities, from using citizen scientists in the UK to gauge the public's appetite for composting biodegradable plastics, to working with clinicians, manufacturers, and wheelchair users in Kenya to develop bespoke wheelchairs by 3D printing. Beyond our education and research, we're also thinking hard about how our own operations and policies could better further the SDGs. We've set challenging targets for the way we operate as a university. By 2024, our aim is for our campus to be free of single-use plastic, for our buildings to be net zero carbon, and to have created 10,000 square meeting, meters of more biodiverse space on campus. At UCL East, our new campus on the site of London's Olympic Park, we aim to bring together UCL academics, students, local communities and industry to solve the biggest challenges affecting people's lives and the planet. Moving forward, we want to continue to champion international, inter-institutional and cross-disciplinary solutions to challenges at local, national and global levels, leading the academic conversation around the practice, application and methodology of the SDGs with our partners. By doing this, we hope we'll not only make UCL a more attractive place to study and work and make our graduates more attractive to employers, but also help us clearly demonstrate and communicate how we and our local global partners are coming to make a difference to people's lives. We realise we cannot address global problems and deliver true impact on our own. We can only achieve this by firstly listening to others who may know more than us, and more broadly by providing opportunities for more and deeper local and global partnerships with other universities, 
with governments, policymakers, industries, and local communities, not just around the world, but also those close to our campus. One example of where we're doing this is our partnership, for example, with the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences and China Agricultural University to improve the efficiency of wheat production across northern China, increasing productivity <coughs> and developing sustainable agriculture. In 2019, this collaboration won a prestigious UK government prize for the best research or innovation that promotes economic development and social welfare. This is exactly the kind of partnership where different perspectives come together to achieve something that neither organization could do alone. This is how I believe real change can be achieved in relation to sustainability in the future. The SDGs truly offer us a common language and framework that can unite academia, students, government and industry to deliver lasting change for people and planet. Let's keep working together to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you very much for having demonstrated so eloquently how you have implemented a very comprehensive and whole of institution approach to the SDGs and not only on campus, but way beyond uh, in the community, but in the broader higher education community at large. Uh, you've mentioned Kenya, Iraq, you, you've, China, Zhejiang. And so this is uh, indeed a unique opportunity for a university as being so centrally located in our societies to make uh, the difference that uh, you are putting uh, in place, actually, that you're orchestrating. Thank you very much for this presentation and please stay with us for the Q&A. I would like to now give the floor to Stephen Garton, or Garton, <laughs> the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Sydney. Um, and I'm very pleased to uh, give you the floor to also talk about this moral obli obligation, as you stressed it, to, for universities to contribute to progress towards the UN SDGs. So um, Stephen Garton, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and Professor President Wu and colleagues, it's a pleasure to be here. And let me also acknowledge um, the previous panelist, Dr. Michael Spence, who was at Sydney for 12 years and led much of the sustainability strategy of Sydney University. So at Sydney, we certainly take sustainability and partnership as crucial to our future. It was one of our researchers collaborating with colleagues in China that first sequenced the genome uh, for the COVID virus, uh, enabling research all around the world in that space. But of course, in the Australian context, with the devastating bushfires of 12 months ago and the once in a hundred year floods uh, that are happening in Sydney this week, uh, all of our staff and students are very mindful of the importance of sustainability and tackling climate change. We have a demand from our staff and students that we do better and we are developing our strategies along those lines to meet that urgent public need and public crisis. The University of Sydney is very proud of what it's been doing in relationship to the sustainable development goals. Uh, we rank very highly in the last times education uh, ranking for impact in this space. But we can't rest on our laurels. So since then, we've developed a more comprehensive sustainability strategy, which is really also about engaging with our First Nations people in Australia to develop their and adapt their ethos of caring for country as the kind of founding rubric for what we want to do in the sustainability space. And of course, what we want to do covers research, and covers education and covers what we do on our own campus in terms of how we embed our knowledge and our understanding in our everyday practices. So just to give you a few examples, we've established the Multidisciplinary Sydney Environment Institute, bringing together environmental humanities and social sciences to understand environmental crises. Our Charles Perkins Centre brings an incredible cross-section of scholars to address the interconnectedness of environment, food and health. And we've been uh, supporting our researchers to take, um, undertake innovative and groundbreaking research in fields such as new forms of energy generation and storage, supply chain analysis, biodiversity, healthy and sustainable food systems, indigenous worldviews, uh, environmental and climate justice and analysing the social, emotional and mental health aspects 
of climate change. We want to see sustainability as a core focal point for research strategies in all of our faculties and all of our multidisciplinary institute. And we're building links, external links, in order to drive that um, strategy and build links with industry, with um, NGOs, with governments and with other universities around the world to devise real world applications for sustainability research. For example, uh, Thomas Mashmeyer, has developed the Endure battery, which is a new form of zinc bromide battery, which is abundant, cheap, and safe, and had their first real world installation on our campus. And that's just one example of many areas of innovation. When we look at the education space, um, we currently have over 8% of all of our units of study that we offer have a core sustainability theme. And now we're building on that basis to put in multidisciplinary sustainability majors at the undergraduate level and at the postgraduate level. We're engaging with um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in uh, Australia to provide multidisciplinary real world opportunities for our students to engage with uh, the needs and um, uh, concerns of those communities. We want to create a whole range of sustainability opportunities for our students to work together across faculty boundaries uh, to provide uh, teamwork based projects for them to really get their teeth into um, fundamental issues. And we provide open learning environment to build uh, industry collaborations and community project units to enable our students to work with a variety of organisations and communities around Australia to provide solutions and develop their learning opportunities. It's a great um, way in which we can enhance the education opportunities for our students. And then in terms of what we do on our own campus, we have to um, not only think about education and research, but actually doing what we practise, practise what we teach. So we've established living labs on all of our campuses around Australia where we can provide them as uh, experimental sites for innovation in terms of what we can do in the sustainability space, ensuring that we um, put into place everyday practice of what we've tested in the labs and what we've tested in the classroom. I've just mentioned the Endure batteries. We're just gonna show you a short 45 second video of what we're doing with that particular piece of research. We hope. So as part of that, we have committed in our sustainability strategy to generate net zero carbon emissions by in all our operations by 2030, to source 100% of our electricity from renewable sources by 2025. We're embedding the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle into our campus culture. We aim to send zero waste to landfill by 2030. And of course, Australia is prone to ever severe drought and our city campuses are not immune. So we aim to reduce our use of potable water by 30% by 2030. COVID I think has shown that rapid behavioral change is possible. And we aim to reduce our emissions impact from flying by 20%, the highest target of any Australian university. And also to make it far easier for our staff and students to travel to campus by sustainable means. And also we are looking at our endowment. So we have just passed through our university governing body, a new 
sustainability investment strategy. We've already reduced our carbon footprint of our investment of our endowment by 70%, but we will be aligning it with the sustainable development goals by 2030 and significantly reduce, further reduce our impact on the um, environment through our own investment strategies. So again, I think the university is committed to driving um, further advancement in research and education and what we do on our campuses around the sustainable development goals. We've achieved much, there's still much to do, and we see partnership and collaboration with industry, with NGOs, and with universities around the world as critical to achieving those aims. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this excellent uh, second presentation on this panel. And um, one, one of the expressions I will probably recycle at some point in another presentation is this importance of getting your teeth into fundamental issues and the importance for this um, uh, hands-on experiences for students, but also for staff, uh, were it academics or administrative, they're all academic, of course, but still. And then multidisciplinarity. I heard that in, uh, in uh, Michael Spence's uh, presentation as well. In yours, it, it comes up very strongly. And if we have time for a q and I will have a question on that. I also see this moral uh, obligation that you very eloquently uh, highlighted here um, as um, to be translated as well in setting the examples for others, uh, not only through ranking mechanisms, but really working with all the universities around the world and show what can be done. There are still universities struggling to uh, find their way into the SDG common language, as Mike Spence did, but to, how to translate that into something that is meaningful for the students uh, and, and for, um, for the staff. So that's where this collaboration, as you mentioned at the end, is so incredibly important. Now I would like to give the floor to Eric Labbé, who's the president of uh, L'Ecole Polytechnique. And I'm very pleased to give you the floor as you would wish to actually speak to a complementary topic, which is how uh, the Ecole Polytechnique is um, uh, training the future responsible leaders uh, and how you've, uh, the, the university has done that actually over more than 200 years. So the floor is yours. So thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, I would like first to thank uh, President Wu for organizing this session, which uh, is, uh, is very uh, an important session. And I'm glad to join with uh, my fellow uh, colleagues uh, this discussion on our commitment uh, on a highly critical societal topic in which universities uh, definitely can and should be uh, involved. Uh, as you mentioned, I would just like to share some of the actions uh, we have been taking at Ecole Polytechnique, and I'm going to use uh, just a few slides, uh, if I can put the, the screen uh, on. Um, it should be... I hope at least you, you can see uh, uh, you can see what uh, some of the slides. Let me start maybe first by you know a few beliefs and action. The first one is uh, around the history of the school has been really around values, around training responsible leadership since uh, you know, Ecole Technique was founded in 1794 and became military uh, when Napoleon granted it this status. And the motto has been for the homeland, science and glory. And somehow the, uh, the goal and the mission of the school has been really to uh, develop leaders to contribute first to the French nation and more broadly now, uh, since we have 40% international students uh, to the world, uh, around the values of general interest, of excellence, and of impact, which I believe uh, are core to uh, the SDG, uh, you know, progress, uh, you know, general interest uh, to uh, build the economy, build the society, obviously the excellence uh, to make sure your know, solutions are provided, and to impact, which is also to make sure that whatever is discovered or whatever you know students are doing is really uh, creating impact in the society. And, and this, uh, you know, could be seen, I put here some of the alumni uh, we have had, uh, they are in you know, all fields, as a corporate technique, develop some of our leaders, be Nobel Prizes, be inventors, uh, be business leaders or uh, head of states. And, uh, and so the developing the values in my mind of the students uh, around, around this, uh, you know, belief and this mindset uh, has been critical at the technique. I do believe also it's really critical 
for the future of society. Now, <clears throat> uh, for the 225th anniversary of the school, which was two years ago, we took a major commitment to sustainable development. We, we did a big symposium, you know, after a year of work where all the stakeholders of the school and partners also were involved. And we took four commitments uh, to the sustainable development. The first one, obviously, around education, uh, ensuring that all our students basically are exposed as well as understand what sustainable development means. Uh, this uh, starts with seminars for every student joining the school, as well as now the aspiration is that every program, every class has somehow some elements of sustainable development in it. Uh, in particular, to try to understand how mass, physics, economy, sociology basically bring perspective and solutions uh, to, the, uh, you know, to the big issues the world is facing, as well as achieving the SDGs, as we have been talking about. The second pillar of our commitment has been around the creation of uh, a big multidisciplinary center. Uh, we talked before about multidisciplinary. It has been at the core of the education of Ecole Polytechnique, both in education as well as in research. And here we, we you know, 26 labs joined together to create energy for climate, which, as the name says, is really around uh, climate change, around providing solutions, uh, starting from physics, but also economics, et cetera, to improve basically the situation on Earth. And we have done that with some of the school joining us, creating the Institut Polytechnique de Paris. And this is one of the uh, pillars of our work. Third, we also basically reach out to our partners around the world, in particular through the launch of an international challenge. Uh, the idea here is to have all the students basically working on a yearly basis on some of the biggest issues. Uh, how to have you know, a carbon-free city was the first topic of the challenge. We had hundreds of students, and obviously we would like to have thousands of students joining this challenge, uh, which is on a six, eight month basis, and uh, basically provides the opportunity to work between universities, uh, creating joint teams on important topics. And the last one, obviously, is that we want to uh, implement ourselves as some of the big principles we are discovering or teaching, and we have been developing a carbon neutral plan to get uh, neutrality on our campus be on energy, on food, on the way we live on the campus over the next uh, 10 years. So this has been now at the core of what we do. We are you know, updating basically our plan, updating our actions along these four dimensions uh, every year. The third element I would to highlight uh, around education is that we have been you know, putting in place a, a lot of modules, a lot of actions to ensure our students act for impact. Uh, you know, it's great to understand, it's great to uh, discover. It's also important to understand how you drive uh, your actions to impact. It's back to the responsible leadership I was mentioning at the beginning, but also it's also linking the science and leadership. It could be on the challenge I mentioned before, a lot of scientific projects that are really on concrete elements beyond the campus, beyond some questions that are asked by, you know, uh, industrial partners, by, you know, some of the labs. It's also through Akaton. Uh, we had one you know, with uh, hundreds of students a few, a few days ago, uh, linking AI and energy efficiency. And in addition to this, it's also important to think about the innovation and the startup creation. And we have a lot of alumni uh, basically creating now uh, some of the sustainable solution through a startup just out of school or a few years after school. Here I just put a few examples and uh, as we can see, it, it starts from, you know, getting some waste into the construction industry, going to, uh, you know, prote protein uh, as a sustainable solution to feed the world. So this spirit uh, is, in my mind, very, very important. And education and research in universities, obviously, uh, is critical to, uh, uh, to, to, to create uh, this uh, capability in our students and also this aspiration uh, to provide solution to the world's biggest issues. Now, let me uh, shift to a second element I wanted to share with you uh, beyond uh, education, which is also to ensure diversity in our school, because in the SDGs, obviously, uh, diversity is a big, uh, a big objective. And here we took two commitments in the last uh, few years. One, obviously, is to raise social diversity uh, as of education system uh, in France, in several countries, uh, sometimes is not as fluid as it should be. And so we took a commitment to double social diversities. 
And we see there is no silver bullet to do that. We have you know, a, a bunch of measures to do that in a few years. Uh, some, of, some of them, in fact, involve all the students of the school to go into the high school and basically uh, you know, explain, uh, inspire, get enthusiasm, uh, enthusiasm among students who may, know, may not know basically uh, what we do at Ecole Polytechnique and in the uh, top engineering school in France. And so going to this uh, high school, uh, we target 20,000 uh, high schoolers. And uh, this is very important because it's part also of the way the students uh, drive their involvement and their commitment. And the other one has been around tutoring and mentoring, uh, as we believe also it's very important to help people succeed, you know, some of the uh, young students to succeed in the national entrance exam. Uh, hundreds of our students basically are going out and helping them uh, to prepare. And the final element I would highlight is our commitment to engage girls and young women in science. Uh, we know, I think, many institutes of science and technology uh, have you know, difficulty going over 30 or 40 percent uh, women. Uh, and even at Ecole Polytechnique, we have programs at 40, we have programs at 20 percent, and we definitely want to uh, inspire and get more uh, girls or young women to, uh, to join uh, the programs. And for that also, we have uh, put a lot of actions in place. Uh, it includes, obviously, the students, the professors are involved. It's, it's not around you know, mentoring. It's around you know, bringing some of the uh, young, uh, you know, from college, uh, not college, but uh, secondary school uh, at Ecole Polytechnique to, uh, to understand what engineering means, what uh, science means. It's a uh, meeting, role models, et cetera, et cetera. And this is very, a very important element. It's, again, it's leaving the SDGs uh, by action uh, in practice. Uh, in our uh, in our school, uh, in addition to teaching basically our students uh, how to serve them. So, in conclusion, I would just like to uh, mention that obviously, you know, Ecole Polytechnique uh, is highly committed. Uh, we are glad to work with a lot of partners, and I, I want to highlight the partnership we have with Zhejiang University. Uh, some of, you know, one of the double degree on renewable energy is obviously at the core of fulfilling our mission uh, to educate the students toward uh, SDGs. And uh, I'm glad that at least we can exchange today and look forward to continuing working together uh, to move along and to achieve the SDGs. Thank you very much, uh, um, President Labbe, uh, for this important uh, contribution as well to showcasing how uh, the translation of the SDGs at the, at the institutional level uh, can take so many different forms. And it, a lot of it revolves also around awakening and educating the next generations and how they will themselves then be uh, the different uh, participants in society, knowing better how to act and how to take on the lead, lead roles that they will have to, to take on in their own uh, future. I very much also like the point on diversity uh, the diversity of approaches, but the diversity of people, since quality is in each and every one of us and higher education is there to uh, allow this, this uh, enormous quality and, and, and potential of people to be, um, to be maximized uh, through all these different actions. Um, we get to the, the last speaker. Um, I would like to invite Wendy Wolford, Vice Provost for International Affairs at Cornell University to uh, also present uh, here and to, to look at different aspects also from where you sit the international affairs and thus focusing uh, more, more specifically on the importance of collaboration. Good afternoon to everyone who's in this online forum on the role of universities in the 2030 agenda. Thank you to my colleagues at Zhejiang University Thank you to President Wu Jiahui and to Professor and Director Min Li. We're really honored to be here. Let me start by saying that the topic of this panel, sustainability, is really very near to Cornell's heart. Sustainability is one of, and maybe the critical problem facing the planet as a whole, and part of the issue in training our students, educating them to be able to lead in a sustainable world, part of the difficulty is that sustainability is a problem that has many different dimensions. It is not simply a technological problem, nor a problem that the market alone can fix. We need to think about sustainability questions 
from an ecological, social, and economic perspective. Cornell University, as most of you know, is both an Ivy League university and a land grant. So we have a mission to create and disseminate knowledge that improves lives for people on the ground. So really is applied to make the world a better place. One of the core concerns at Cornell University is the question of sustainability. We have many different student organizations and faculty and campus events that are dedicated to sustainability. And I will say that a lot of that is driven by the students. So sustainability, it's a question about the student's future, and they're the ones who are pushing for more engagement on this issue, more education. And we as faculty and administrators, what we have to do is provide them the support, the tools that they need in order to be able to take on these questions. We have over 40 student organizations. Our students are very much involved in community service around sustainability, and our faculty, at last count, one third of our faculty were doing research on something related to sustainability. They're all connected in what we call peer-to-peer -peer networks where every single student, staff, and faculty person at Cornell can access the network in order to ask any question that they might have about sustainability. Where to get the meal that's the most sustainable? how to do carbon offsets, where on campus can you find out information about sustainable engineering projects, and so on. Our faculty can find each other because we've created a center, the Cornell Atkinson Center for Sustainability, which has over 600 faculty fellows from every different discipline on campus. They come together through topical lunches, through events, and through research projects, as you can see here where the Atkinson Center funds every year a series of projects with teams who are interested in using multiple tools from different disciplines, different perspectives to answer complicated questions such as wildlife management, particularly now, uh, that's a core question in an age of epidemics, to questions of migration and the relationship between climate change and migration decisions, to here in the lower corner, a farmer-focused internet of things. As I said, students are really at the heart of this future and this interest in sustainability. And so they've taken the initiative to create everything from a green guide to campus, how to be sustainable on campus, to a set of student clubs, to the peer-to-peer -peer network. We also have jobs and opportunities that we provide for our students and a fair bit of student funding where we can support them in new research and in new activities dedicated to questions of sustainability. One of the ways in which students are increasingly involved around sustainability brings together their uh, innovation as well as their penchant for entrepreneurship. So hackathons are a way to connect students to corporations, to mentors in organizations outside the university. This particular hackathon was to apply digital tools to sustainable agriculture. And it's part of what we call our A5 network, the top five agricultural schools in the world who partner to have global impact. So that, as you can see here, is Cornell University, Wageningen, the University of California at Davis, China Agricultural University, and the State University of Sao Paulo. The winning team for this most recent hackathon in digital agriculture put together an interface, so really an app for any smart device that would help farmers to make the best decision about where to uh, plant, sell, and market their crops. The reason why they came up with this app was to try to address the very serious question of farmer suicides, particularly in India. So it's an app that has interesting questions around the digital interface, but also a real social component in a very core issue for a sustainable future, which is our food supply. One of the main ways in which we try to support students in their learning around sustainability is by turning the campus into a living laboratory. So we think about this from the perspective of One Health, 
which is a, a perspective that was uh, launched by the vet school at Cornell, the veterinary medicine college at Cornell, where we take uh, plants and the environment, animals and humans together to understand the context in which they live. One of the ways in which we are turning the campus into a living laboratory is through earth source heat, where we extract heat from roughly two miles down in the earth, circulating water through a series of wells that when it comes back to the surface is hot enough to hopefully heat most of our buildings by the time we're actually ready to move forward on this project. As you can imagine, this brings together students and faculty from engineering, from our facilities division, from our art architecture and planning unit, um, a whole series of opportunities for learning where they live. We also have a farmer's market on campus that is staffed and um, serviced by our student run farm, as well as by local farmers. And we have a, an annual ag day where we bring students from other areas of campus who might not be directly connected to agriculture, but who need to know more about where their food comes from, how it's produced and how to make that uh, system more sustainable. We also have quite a bit of student interest in the landscaping on campus, how to make that more sustainable and how to make their own interactions with the environment more pleasant and more sustainable. And here you see what happens when you bring art students together with horticulture students. They've created through a set of permaculture techniques what are what is called a sod sofa so that you are directly connected to the earth when you're doing something as simple as taking a break from class. The students on campus have really pushed us to be very intentional about campus operations. So through a series of meetings and committees and discussions over a few years, we created a climate action plan that the students, the faculty, administration um, have really uh, signed on to as a set of commitments for um, uh, we expect to be a ca carbon neutral campus by 2035. I think that goal might actually be a little bit closer for better or for worse because of this incredibly unusual moment with the pandemic. So the pandemic uh, caught everybody by surprise, um, but has provided a real opportunity for thinking in ways uh, that are innovative and might transform our relationship to questions of sustainability. Here you can see that we have a database that tracks our progress towards carbon neutrality. And I think we'll think about the pandemic as almost a living laboratory in and of itself. It has brought home the need to think in a way that is innovative and collaborative across disciplines, across species, and across regions of the globe to think about how to organize life on this planet in a way that ensures that we will still be here hundreds of years into the future. This means that we need to think about new ways of researching, of teaching and engagement, particularly around questions of sustainability. So we hope that the campus the planet, and even our own students can be living laboratories for us to understand questions of sustainability into the future. Thank you. Good afternoon Thank you to very everyone. Much. <laughs> Thank you very much for this very uh, uh, good presentation. Again, insisting uh, on a very important point, and that is the social dimension as well. Something that was picked up by the three other speakers, uh, but emphasized here uh, just a little bit further. Um, I take away from this session for now. I see we have no time for a discussion. I hope there will be an opportunity to maybe exchange later. This is where we see the limits of online forums. But I take away from this uh, panel and the, the excellent speakers that I warmly thank here, uh, the notions and the importance of interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinary approaches where you can teach uh, other universities around the world that may come to you to ask how to, 
<laughs> and the whole of institution approach, which is very uh, nicely illustrated by your four presentations, the importance as well to connect the different disciplines from the arts to sciences um, and all around uh, with everybody on board. And then the importance of the local mission of the university spending from the local locality being just around the university to the national level, but at the global level as well, because you all stressed the very um, high importance of engage, engaging at the global level. So I'll leave it at this because there are uh, two other very important sessions coming up. And I thank all the speakers for their uh, wonderful preparation and presentation in this forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Land and the panelists for your inspiring presentations and discuss and the, in presentations. I'm sorry that we don't have time for the uh, questions, but hopefully that we will um, send you the uh, questions and uh, get back to the audience with the, some of the answers later. Thank you. Now let's move on to the uh, second session, moderated by my colleague, Professor Kevin Zhigang Chen, International Dean of China Academy for Rural Development. Kevin, now the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Director Lee. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. I'm Kevin Chen from Zhejiang University. I'm very honored to be here to moderate uh, session two. Uh, a very powerful message come actually out from session one. Working together is uh, very critical. So we, in this panel, we have four very distinguished speakers to talk with us on advancing scientific uh, collaborations. And uh, each panelist will have roughly seven minutes to share their thoughts. And I'd like to make sure that we will stay on time. So let's uh, first to welcome uh, Dr. Rocky Tuan, uh, President of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And uh, Dr. Tuan is also biomedical scientist by training. Dr. Tuan, please, floor is yours. Unmute, okay, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I've got to unmute. Uh, is my share screen working? Yes. Yes, it works. Oh, okay, great. Thanks. Uh, so uh, let me first uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Wu and uh, and the my Zhejiang uh, colleagues for this uh, organizing this fantastic uh, conference. I'll talk pretty fast because I really want to share a couple of things, uh, uh, important ideas uh, with all of you, and. Um, the first point I want to make is actually uh, about social responsibility. What is social responsibility? I, I want to cite uh, the American philosopher T.M. Scanlon, a Harvard uh, philosopher. Uh, this book that he wrote, What We Owe to Each Other, really is at the heart of morality for the world. That it, it, uh, it um, uh, talks about the positive value of a way of living with others. And that really should be our social responsibility. And that also should be the responsibility of a university. And uh, in fact, um, what we have, um, what we have uh, done for uh, the uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong is that beginning this year, we put together an office called Social Responsibility and Sustainable Development Office. And we put together university sustainability responsibilities that we actually want to maintain and to propagate and to teach. And to also uh, uh, promote global connections to advance sustainable development in the communities. Now, the, uh, some of the examples that we have already done just a couple of them. First of all, we have done very well in, in reducing carbon footprint. We have collaborated with the Hong Kong Ocean Park to promote biodiversity and conservation. And we introduced a new diversity and inclusion policy uh, last year. Now, other things that we have done, uh, that 
that we want to summarize them and say, look, we can do it ourselves, but can we actually do it with the rest of the world to promote the SDGs? Now, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I think all of you are aware of the SDSN, the, the uh, uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network. There are 40 such national and regional networks in the world. Hong Kong has one. There are 10 thematic networks, and they're all together about 1,400 members, including universities, research institutes, and NGOs. We launched the SDSN in Hong Kong in January 2018, and co-hosted by CUHK and the Hong Kong Jockey Club Charities Trust. We have now connected, our job is to connect researchers with international experts in order to mobilize scientific and technological expertise to promote practical solutions for the SDG. And in fact, is to localize these 17 SDGs so that we can actually make them work in terms of education and our commitment to society. Now, our global footprint actually is quite uh, substantial. Uh, we have more than uh, 460 partners in universities and institutions. We've signed many MOUs just last year, renewed them, 35 countries, 15 plus global alliances, and more than 60 joint research units. In fact, last year, or this year rather, uh, we have been ranked by Times Higher Education as the third most international university in the world. So pretty happy with where we are. Now, some of the global alliances we have formed, just to list a few here, uh, uh, the uh, Association of Pacific Rim University, Worldwide University Network, uh, ANSO, IAU, and also the Guangdong Hong Kong Macau University Alliance. But we strongly believe that research excellence must be coupled to global partnerships in order to achieve the 17 SDGs. Now, some of uh, uh, CEHK have been committed to these four strategic areas of research for quite a few years. China studies, translational biomedicine, information and automation technology, and environmental and uh, global sustainability. Now, many of the topics within these areas align with many of the SDGs. Just to give a couple of examples, in Hong Kong, uh, the uh, probably the largest funding scheme was called Area of Excellence. The University Grants Committee, which run all our uni all eight universities in Hong Kong, uh, have all together put together uh, put put up twenty four such AOEs, and CHK actually has already obtained eleven such projects. So we've done well uh, in Hong Kong. In addition. Uh, the state key laboratories of China, we have five of them in Hong Kong, translational, uh, CUHK, translational oncology, agrobiotechnology, medicinal plants, synthetic chemistry, as well as digestive diseases. In terms of our global research alliance, we have very close partners with Oxford, Exeter, ETH Zurich, Utrecht, as well as Sydney. And the topics include disaster and humanitarian response, environment, sustainability, musculoskeletal research, and integrative medicine. Two notable things that we have done, and what I really want to share with you, and they're really at the heart of SDGs. The first one is two years ago, we set up an Institute of Health Equity in collaboration with uh, uh, UCL, in fact, to build an Asian based research and policy network to improve health equity. And in 2013, we established the world's first museum of climate change to promote climate action with global partners. In fact, uh, this just last Saturday, we have a 1 million visitor real uh, uh, cause for celebration. We have many partners all over the world Australian Museum, American Alliance Museum, National Geographic, etc. Now, looking forward, the next five years, what do we want to do? The first thing is that we want to strengthen the network of investors, 
startups and enterprises in Hong Kong, the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, the mainland, and the world. And also to deepen partnerships with institutions in research and innovation to multiply our positive impact on tackling societal, economic, and, env and environmental challenges. Now, just to share with you three themes that we are pursuing. They're called themes of harmony. The first one is for people. Uh, our goals are to improve public health through preventive health care research and outreach, which addresses SDG 3, 4, and 10. Secondly, to increase equal access to and the impact of quality education through creativity and technology, which addresses SDGs 4 and 10. The next two harmonies that we want to achieve, one is social and the other one is environmental and economic. To promote diversity, inclusion, and partnerships through understanding and respect, SDGs 16 and 17. To pursue climate action and commit to the ambition of carbon neutrality by 2038, which will be the 75th anniversary for CHK. And then finally, to advocate responsibility by setting standards and creating solutions, which addresses uh, SDGs 8 and 12. So let me just conclude by just giving you a final food for thought. Uh, as uh, the uh, chair uh, mentioned, I work on uh, biomedical science, specifically regenerative medicine. And just like Steve Garden, I also have three R's. In the field of regenerative medicine, we put genes, cells, biomaterials together to regenerate. So we repair, we restore, and we recreate. That actually goes quite well with uh, Jeff what Jeffrey Sachs said earlier this year related to the COVID era challenges, containment of transmission, rapid vaccination, and the establishment of emergency finance. We must collaborate. In fact, it, this reminds me of the multiple choice questions that we all get in exams, A, B, C, D, or all of the above. I would say for the SDGs, the all of the above is the most important one. Number 17, partnerships for the goals. So I would urge all of us to partner. And um, to quote another saying in the book, University Social Responsibility and Quality of Life, universities should go beyond the core functions of teaching, research, and service, and voluntarily act beyond legal requirements to promote the public good and environmental sustainability. We must be civic. We have civic responsibilities. And the pandemic really has taught us that social responsibility is the right direction, is the true north. We are being challenged. We must stand up and take this challenge. And that together, we will work towards a bright future for humanity. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, President Duan, for exciting um, presentation. And congratulations to the Chinese University of Hong Kong uh, to be the co-host of Hong Kong chapter of United Nations uh, SDSN that put the Chinese University of Hong Kong right in the front line to advance SDG goals. And, uh, um, personally, I'm also very much looking forward to visit your very first Museum of Climate Change as soon as possible. The second speaker of this panel is Dr. Svan Sterling, Director of University of uh, Oslo. Dr. Sterling is also Professor of Chemistry. R Dr. Sterling, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, dear President Wu, dear friends, I'm delighted to be here today to participate in this important discussion about universities and our role in the global knowledge society within the framework of the 2030 agenda. The coming 10 years will be crucial for the realization of the goals of the sustainability agenda. Together, we need to secure 
a sustainable biosphere, a sustainable economy, and a sustainable society meeting the citizens' social needs. Universities will and must play a central role in this, globally, nationally, and regionally. And in order to succeed, we need to cross not only disciplinary borders, but also national and cultural borders. And we need to cross this in new ways. And in particular, I believe we need to create more equal and mutually beneficial partnerships between universities and groups of universities across the globe, the whole globe. Allow me to start a little bit uh, in a special way uh, with a short historical reference from my own university and my own nation. And then I will explain why I do this, of course. After the decades of struggle, the Royal Frederick University, now the University of Oslo, was established in 1811, three years before Norway got its independence. Six years after the establishment of the university, Frederick Holst received the first doctoral degree in Norway. His work was of great importance to the weakest in society and significantly improved their living conditions. He traveled around Europe for several years to learn and brought home new and radical ideas on how a nation should organize a healthcare system and how one should uh, treat both the sick and the criminals. He had really a large impact. And that's an inspiration for how we work at the University of Oslo today. The story of Freddy Holst and his doctoral doctorate tells us how important the university was for a young nation like Norway and how important international knowledge sharing was. The university became a central force in building the nation and both the nation and our university gradually developed from being a university mainly importing knowledge. Step by step, so the scientists were able to contribute at the forefront of science and research and the university developed as a robust institution able to take part in partnerships across the globe on more equal basis. Today, we are strongly committed to international collaboration and partnerships or excellent collaboration with today, today's uh, host, Saijang University is an excellent example and we are very happy to have this very strong relationship. And a world map out, uh, that describes our international efforts contains really few white spots. And that is my point here today. I mean, we are in Europe and we are engaged with European universities, of course. We are at the present moment leading a newly established European university, Circle U, where our aim is to create an inclusive European uh, university ecosystem where students are able to move more seamlessly uh, between different campuses, Oslo, Paris, London, Berlin. We, have, we are doing this together with King's College in London, Humboldt University in Berlin and so on. But I believe that we also are rethinking and redesigning our international collaboration in general. And for me, it's obvious that um, strong international cooperation is needed now, possibly more than ever. And to ensure that countries all over the world have the means to meet present day challenges, be it the current pandemic, be it the climate crisis, lack of energy access or issues of hunger. No man is an island is a famous poem by John Donne. People and nation in this world are strongly interlinked. One nation cannot tackle global challenges on its own and no nation can or should be left behind. A sustainable, a successful sustainable development agenda requires inclusive partnerships at the global, regional, national and local levels and within all sectors of society. And I believe that the present day gigantic global scientific efforts to develop vaccines to mitigate the devastating impact of COVID-19 on societies serve as an example because we have reached a point where the mass production and use of effective vaccines are a reality very fast. But in the subsequent race that is unfolding to produce and purchase vaccines, the gross global inequalities in the access to vaccinations, as well as to the science that makes that possible, have been exposed. Scientific inequality is a major global challenge that we have to attack together. Many countries do not have the necessary scientific capacity due to years of political marginalization of the issue or due to an accompanying structural underfunding. A lot, although not all, can be attributed to low-income countries adopting a focus on bilateral and multilateral donors on primary and lower secondary education, children from 6 to 15. That's important, 
But as a consequence, most universities in these regions are lagging behind the rest of the world, especially when it comes to research and innovation capacity and productivity. In many instances, this has contributed to a massive brain drain from countries in low income uh, parts of the world, making national efforts to establish resilient political system, well-functioning institution and sustainable development in general quite difficult. This implies that in accordance with the UN sustainability development goals, supporting the development of strong research institutions in low income parts of the world that operate on the knowledge frontier and are equipped to absorb and adopt uh, new technologies should be an absolute priority in uh, collaborations, corporations in the future. The efforts need to be embedded in the concrete societal realities of local, national, regional, continental context, because the challenges for research and innovation and higher education will have different manifestations in different parts of the world. The efforts must furthermore strengthen the pipeline of scientific talent in that uh, in all directions through doctoral exchange and collaboration that encourages mobility without causing brain drain, but rather predictable career opportunities for talented scientists in robust institutions in also low-income countries. In doing so, we must also move from more project-based funding to long-term institutionalized collaboration between universities globally. These partnerships must build on scientific principles, academic values, and upon a shared vision and shared goals, placing people and the planet at the center. And the University of Oslo would like to really be a strong power in this development. We welcome such collaboration and we hope that we can further develop a lot of such corporations and partnerships with uh, your institution here today. And I look forward to, to discussing this matter further with you at this conference or later. So I really thank you again, Professor uh, President Wu for invitation. I think this is an excellent opportunity to also look forward for uh, efforts to uh, that matter for the whole globe. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Regulus Sterling. Uh, COVID-19 highlights that there are always the country, region, or the population who are more vulnerable. So thank you for highlighting the importance of having an inclusive, more equal, and a mutually beneficial partnership in science. Uh, the third speaker of this panel is Dr. Andrei Rodskoy, the rector from Peter's Great St. Petersburg Polytechnical University, Russia. So let's welcome Rector Radskoy to make the speech. Thank you very much. Dear Professor Z, dear Stephanie, dear colleagues, good afternoon. I want to thank our strategic partner, Zhejiang University and President Wu for organizing this excellence forum. Colleagues, sorry for my English, and now I will use translation. <laughs> Я благодарю. Так. Thank you for the opportunity to present the mission, vision, and activities of Peter the Great St. Petersburg Polytechnic University in the context of United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Peter the Great, St. Petersburg Polytechnic University is one of the leading and largest technical universities in Russia. In 2024, the university will celebrate its anniversary 125 years since its foundation in 1899. I would like to take this opportunity to invite all colleagues to take part in the celebration. The unique campus of our university is a small city inside a big city. It includes four metro stations. It is located in a beautiful park and represents one of the key points of attraction of the urban environment. Over 35,000 students study at SPBPU and there are 8,500 foreign students among them. 12 institutes and 30 higher schools carry out research and training specialists in the entire spectrum of natural science, engineering, and economics. 
There were three Nobel Prize winners working at our university, among 2,000 teachers and professors of our university, about 300 are visiting professors from leading universities of different countries. The Polytech is the winner and participants of all major Russian national programs in the development of research and education, innovative university, national research university, academic excellence project 5100, program for the establishment of national technological initiative centers and world-class research centers. According to the World Ranking Agency Times Higher Education, the Polytechnic University is ranked 301, 350 in the world, and in subject rankings, it takes strong positions in physics, engineering, computer science, as well it received five-star category in QS ranking in the field of online education 2020. According to the significant time higher education university impact ranking, which focuses on the role and influence of universities in terms of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, Peter the Great St. Petersburg Polytechnic University got 37th position in the world and regarding the particular UN goals, for example, the development of clean energy and the impact of the climate, SPBBU got fifth position in the world. To study new trends, exchange experts' opinions in various fields, the UNESCO chair, management of the quality of education in the interest of sustainable development, has been established at SPBPU. The chair acts as an integrator of a number of large projects and organizes the most important meetings of the national and international level. In June 2020, a conference on the interaction of UNESCO chairs for sustainable development was held. The chairman was Grigory Orjenikidze, executive secretary of the Commission of the Russian Federation for UNESCO. In 2022, the Polytech will become the venue for the session of the UNESCO World Heritage Committee. In the interest of sustainable development, the Polytech is implementing large projects and developing new technologies to solve global problems. Let's start with technologies for obtaining clean energy which has always been among the priority areas of research at the Polytechnic University. One of our areas of expertise is solutions and technologies for the Arctic. The largest national project being implemented by the Polytech is the development of special technologies and the creation of a power supply network for the Arctic territories based on combined wind turbines. Our wind turbines have already been installed along the entire northern coast of Eurasia from Arkhangelsk to Kamchatka and operate reliably in northern conditions of glaciation, unstable winds, and difficult soils. We developed autonomous wind structures for being placed on the Arctic shelf, including floating ones, in cooperation with our Finnish colleagues. The second most important source of clean energy is the use of biomass, the production of further processing of biogas. Many countries are conducting research in this field. This is a huge potential for the sustainable development future of our planet. Polita has developed a unique technology for a full cycle of processing, biogas production from municipal solid waste, methane purification up to 98%, and its fair conversion into pure hydrogen, including fuel production. The cycle is practically waste-free and is registered unique technology that has already been tested at a number of experimental sites, both in Russia and abroad. We immediately include new technologies developed by the Polytechnic University in the curricula for our students. Specialized educational courses, also developed in an online format, are available on the open platforms of the Open Polytech and the Coursera. Climate change and water management are critical to sustainable development. The long-term experience of the Polytechnic University as the founder of the Scientific School of Hydraulic Engineering has taken on a new significance in recent years. The task of water resource management are interdisciplinary tasks requiring digitalization and multivariate data analysis, modeling of physical and economic processes. I will mention only two studies that have become an example of this approach. A digital model, digital twin of the Ob Irtish Basin, has been developed at the Polytechnic University. This is one of the largest water systems in the world. 
The model includes all data on water reserves, geography, geological features, and regional economics. Using this model, it is possible to predict the impact of, for example, climate change, catastrophic floods, as well as man-caused impacts. For a number of rivers in the central and southern regions of Russia, Specialists in hydraulic engineering of our university have created predictive models of the function, you know, water use hydraulic system, taking into account several options for assessing global climate change and the corresponding impact on the water supply of this region. Getting back from digital models to direct applicable technical solution, the university has developed a unique technology for purifying drinking water, which we are creating in the framework of an international collaboration. Such an installation allows us to solve the problem of providing clean water in the most environmentally friendly ways, including the treatment of industrial effluents and water supply in large cities. Urban development and the cities of the future are another UN sustainable goal. Now digital technologies and construction are developing at an accelerated pace. This allows to design truly smart buildings and build the largest urban infrastructures for minimal impact on the environment. Such projects were developed by the Polytechnic University for St. Petersburg and Russia. This is participation in the design of the construction of a flood prevention complex dam in the Gulf of Finland and a unique project of Zenit football stadium, Gazprom Arena and beam technologies used in the design and construction of the highest skyscraper in Europe, Lachta Center. Our campus has become an experimental research and educational platform for the introduction of green technologies and urbanism. These include students' initiative, waste sorting and recycling systems, new technological units for heating buildings, a number of international projects exploring new technologies for energy-efficient outdoor lighting system. We are proud that our students are actively involved in the development and support of the implementation of such principles of organizing the university campus life. They share the desire of the Polytechnic University to save natural resources. One excellent example of partnership and students' engagement in the urban planning agenda is the WC2 World Cities World Class University Network. It includes the leading universities in the largest cities on all continents. Russia is represented by our university. Within the WC2 network, the global problems of big cities are targeted. It's transport, logistics, business development, and healthcare. The network is expanding and we are ready to discuss with our partners the new universities interested in participating in this effective project. Economic development is another area of UN priorities. They can be achieved through the fulfillment of a whole range of factors. As a part of a large national project, the Polytechnic University is working on a comprehensive model for the economic development of the Arctic zone, including the consequences of climate change, new realities of the logistics of the Northern Sea Route, urban planning and the development of the Arctic territories. Together with European partners, as well as design models of regional economic development based on the principles of a green economy and the creation of sustainable networks of small businesses. The most important task, as I have already mentioned, of the Polytechnic University is to create an appropriate educational environment. We provide our students with a range of opportunities that foster entrepreneurship, creativity and the potential for innovation. These are special educational programs that combine engineering and entrepreneurship, such as Politex Trashek, Student Startup Support Center, and the Creative Space Boiling Point. Summarizing the accumulated experience, the Polytechnic University initiated the first in Russia specialized edition, Sustainable Development and Engineering Economics, having invited international experts and scientists from all over the world to join the editorial board. Taking this opportunity, I would like to thank my colleagues from Zhejiang University who joined the editorial board. Realizing our mission in the context of sustainable development goals, we have come up with a strategy for the Polytechnic University development. Based on the strongest scientific schools and areas of research and proposed a format that allows us to concentrate resources on crucially important tasks. 
This concept formed the basis for the establishment of a world-class research center in the field of advanced digital technologies and the Polytechnic University, which was supported by the Russian government in the summer of 2020. The center accumulates resources not only of the Polytechnic University, but as well attracts Russian and foreign partners and brings together leading scientists. It has funding which allows to quickly form interdisciplinary teams to target global problems. I cannot tell about all 35 laboratories of the center, but I will give only two outstanding examples of effective work in this format. Electric car, Kama 1. The first electric car in Russia was developed at the National Technology Initiative Center of the Polytechnic University using digital design. Digital Twins is a unique in a unique period of time. It took only two years from an idea to a ready-made product for production car. Moreover, this is a platform solution. This is a whole range of vehicles from cars to buses that have has been developed. Digital design helped to save a lot of resources for serial launch of the model is being discussed with our main partner, Kamas company. At our research center, other types of environmentally friendly transport are being actively developed, in particular water transport, catamarans and boards. They are electric, solar powered and energy saving. An example of an effective team building for solving global pro problems and challenges is our biomedical research cluster. Last year, the whole world was faced with a pandemic, including Russia and our scientists of various expertise came together to develop a model for the spread of the virus in an urban environment. Virologists, biophysicists, mathematicians, sociologists, logistics specialists and programmers. In record time, the model was ready. Just two months later, the first forecasts and recommendations for St. Petersburg, Moscow and many regions were presented at the national level. Throughout the year, the model we developed demonstrated excellent results of the predicted data with the actual state of the pandemic and formed the basis for the measures and restrictions taken in the country. This approach of rapid concentration of resources when conducting frontier research and solving global problems of sustainable development of our regions and countries will become the main development strategy of the Polytechnic University for the coming years. Peter the Great St. Petersburg Polytechnic University sees its mission in the development of technologies and the creation of such an educational environment that will make it possible to wisely manage the precious resources of our planet as well as provide future generations with knowledge, ideas, aspirations for the sustainable development of mankind. We are always open to cooperation, new ideas and innovations. We are looking forward to the final victory over the pandemic in order to be able to invite all colleagues to visit our beautiful Peter the Great St. Petersburg Polytechnic University to communicate face to face. Once again, I thank all the organizers and participants of today's forum. Wishing all you good luck and good health. Well, thank you, Rector Radoskoy, for a very comprehensive introduction of your beautiful university. Our final speaker uh, is Dr. Norihiro Tokito, Vice President of Kyoto University. And uh, Dr. Tokito is also a professor of chemistry. And uh, Vice President Tokito, please, floor is yours. <laughs> So thank you for your kind of introduction. So I have to uh, share my so uh, slides. Uh, so uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, express my sincere thanks for the President Boo and the organizers for the, the preparation of this nice online forum. And uh, so before starting my talk, I'd like to uh, introduce our university briefly. So the year 2022, so we mark the 125th anniversary of the Kyoto University's founding. And the Kyoto University is a comprehensive university comprising uh, 10 undergraduate faculties and uh, 18 graduate schools and uh, 19 research institutes and centers and uh, 43 off-campus uh, research and education facilities throughout Japan. And the total number of students are uh, more than 22,000, and the uh, faculty and the uh, staff members, so we have uh, more than 7,000 members. And uh, 
next slides. Uh, and here you can see the, the photo of our new president, uh, Dr. Nagahiro Minato. Uh, he was uh, just appointed at the 27th uh, president uh, on uh, last October. And our university, Kyoto University has a, uh, since its foundation, we have a university mission and to sustain and de develop its uh, historical commitment to academic uh, freedom and to pursue harmonious coexistence within the human and the ecological community on, the, on this planet. So uh, this is a uh, focus on the global welfare that long predates the uh, formulation of the United Nations as the DGs. And in line with uh, today's uh, theme of the advancing scientific collaboration, I'd like to introduce uh, some of the Kyoto University's uh, good practices uh, that relate to the SDGs. So next one, please. And uh, here you can see the, the many research institutes and centers uh, with the, some so alphabetical names. And uh, it covers uh, many research fields, humanities and social sciences and natural sciences, engineering, medical sciences, and life sciences. And uh, uh, with this uh, such uh, facilities, uh, uh, we so call this uh, alliance as a KURKA, Kyoto University Research Coordination Alliance. And uh, through the KURKA, the university encourages the bottom-up uh, initiatives that integrate the different disciplines and uh, develop new fields of the research. Next one, please. And uh, here you can see the one example. So we have a, a center for the, so please go to the page seven. Okay. And uh, this uh, research unit uh, was established in uh, Kuruka as a research collaboration platform for the research institute and centers. And uh, four research units has been established and one of them is uh, focusing on the uh, SDGs uh, research. And uh, from the dual respect uh, perspectives on constructing a global scale, so the life sphere infrastructure, and uh, the other one is a material energy circulation system. And uh, the units pursued education and research to promote a sustainable society by addressing issues relating to environment and the resources, natural disasters, and the epidemics, and the humanities and social sciences. Next one, please. And uh, here you can see the, another example. And uh, through the international research in collaboration with the University of Overseas, Kyoto University's uh, graduate schools implement uh, international joint education programs in the fields of the contribute to sustainable development. And for example, the International Advanced Energy Science Research and Education Center, established within the Graduate School of Energy Science, uh, held a joint symposium with uh, Zhejiang University in China and the Azure University in South Korea, and has launched a double uh, degree doctoral program in collaboration with uh, Zhejiang University. Next one, please. And here you can see the international partners, overseas offices and facilities of Kyoto University. To date, and Kyoto University has uh, concluded that 20, uh, 201 institutional level uh, collaboration agreements with the overseas partners and has established three overseas uh, bases uh, in North America, Europe, and the ASEAN regions. In addition, so 11 uh, on-site laboratories uh, have been recently established in collaboration with overseas partner universities and research institute to pursue collaborative education and research activities. Through such uh, uh, efforts, uh, we will develop an extensive international network, the final priest. And uh, here you can see the ongoing academic collaboration with the partner universities. And uh, Kyoto University is actively engaged in the institutional level collaborations with many of the universities uh, participating in this forum today, including the host, Zhejiang University. And uh, we hope that this forum will promote the expansion of the academic collaboration for the sustainable development. 
And uh, if you became interested in the activities in Kyoto University, so I hope uh, we can do uh, much more collaborative uh, research and education in future. Thank you for your kind attention. Well, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Vice President Tokedo, um, which uh, is very impressive to observe that uh, harmoniously coexistence of human and ecological community development actually is written into the mission of the university. Um, also, we probably need to wrap up with this session due to the uh, time limit. And uh, so we probably will skip the question and answer session, hopefully to the later occasion. And uh, so please join me again to thank all our four speakers for their insightful observation and thoughts on advancing scientific collaboration for the UN Sustainable Development Goal. Thank you very much. Back to, to you, Ms. Lee. Okay, thank you, Kevin, and the uh, panelists for your great presentations. And uh, we're very sorry that due to the time limit, we're not able to do the Q&A session. So hopefully, <coughs> we'll get back to you with the answers later on. And our final session will focus on Green Campus and will be moderated by Professor Anna Brombacher, Vice President International Relations of TUE. Please stay tuned. Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, and it's a great honor here to be um, uh, chairing this session on behalf of Eindhoven University. My name is Arnold Brommacher, I'm Vice President uh, International Relations of Eindhoven University. And we have four distinguished speakers who will share with us their ideas on the greener campus. And uh, the first uh, presentation on this context is by Professor Tan Eng Chi, President of National University of Singapore. And he will talk about the campus where I myself have been a guest and a host for about seven years. Uh, so. I really enjoyed that beautiful part of the world. Uh, Professor Tan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, allow me to share screen. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope everyone is keeping well. Thanks to Zhejiang University and uh, President Wu for inviting me to this forum. It is my great pleasure to share with you some of NUS experience in building a sustainable campus for learning, discovery, and living. So we have three campuses uh, on 160 hectares of land, 17 schools, 31 university level institutes. Uh, we have 42,000 students, of which about 31,000 are undergraduate students, and we also have about 13,000 staff. Uh, sustainability has been and remains a core tenet of our university, underpinning the pillars of education, research, innovation, and operations. I'd like to share uh, two examples uh, at NUS uh, of how we actually built two green precincts, one from scratch, a university town, which was uh, started in 2011, and the other one, the School of Design and Environment precinct, currently being retrofitted to further our green agenda. Uh, this is an area view of university town. Uh, it is a sustainably built high density precinct. Uh, as you can see, U-Town uh, is an extension of the NUS Cambridge campus. Uh, it is also a unique opportunity for NUS to create from scratch, converting a former golf course into a sustainably designed, built and operated precinct at a scale for the very first time. It is also actually the first educational institution in Singapore to be certified uh, as a green mark district. Uh, here are some numbers of Utah in figures. Uh, uh, of particular importance is the savings in electricity uh, as well as water uh, from the business as usual uh, for unit area. 
Now, there are some key sustainability features of New Town. Uh, these are some of the features, like buildings being positioned in a north-south direction to reduce exposure to direct sunlight and also to minimize cooling loads. There are also major circulation areas that are naturally ventilated. And there's actually a lot of thought put in to integrate the built and the natural environment so that we preserve much of the rolling terrain and natural biodiversity. Uh, Newtown also, uh, it's a sort of a living lab and a constant reminder to our students and staff on the sustainability agenda and nature conservation. So we hold a lot of events, even we have uh, gadgets like paper use gadgets uh, in the residential colleges. So Utah is really a sandbox for sustainability practices at NUS where we can experiment with bold ideas such as centralized district cooling, incorporation of natural ventilation and biodiversity, and also pedestrianization of the whole precinct. Uh, let me move on to uh, another precinct. This is uh, SDE4. Uh, SDE4 is Singapore's first purpose-built zero energy building. And uh, this is, I believe, the first for an educational institution in Southeast Asia. And it was completed in 2019. It contains a number of features, well, other than the 1,260 solar panels on its rooftop, uh, it serves as a living laboratory to explore impact of buildings on human health and well-being. And uh, we also have a number of labs in collaboration with corporate partners, such as City Development Limited, which is a local, a very prominent local developer on smart and green homes, and also with uh, Johnson Controls Open Blue Innovation Center. And we did not stop at SE4. In fact, uh, this picture that you see is SDE-1, which is an old building which was built in the 1970s. So it is actually 40 plus years. Uh, we have just retrofitted it and uh, we have learned from our experience. And uh, in fact, we are retrofitting these two buildings to be net zero energy as well. And we are leveraging on NUS in-house expertise for design as well as uh, utilizing an existing NUS carbon bank. There are quite a lot of details. This is another view. Uh, we, we really hope that the SDE precinct will be a blueprint for the entire NUS uh, for environmentally sensitive design and also climate stewardship for a sustainable future. Let me briefly share with you uh, what are our plans for the next 10 years. So looking ahead, we have a Climate Action Plan 2030, of which there are two signature initiatives, the Carbon Neutral Campus, as well as Cool NUS, actually by four degrees. Uh, the Carbon Neutral uh, Campus uh, we are developing, or in fact, we have developed a digital twin of the campus. And uh, this is used for our campus planning and environmental simulation. And we have about 40,000 sensors, and we are adding more across the campus to measure various environmental parameters. And this allows us to manage energy uh, well and uh, also tap on renewable energy, as well as well, we are planting 10,000 trees a year to hit 100,000 trees uh, to help in carbon sequestration. Now, the next thing is uh, urban heat. And, uh, NUS is not spared from urban heat, and uh, it is also one of the key tasks to try to cool NUS by four degrees. Right, so we want to reduce solar gain uh, and heat load. Well, as making sure, as I've said earlier, 
planting trees across campus in the hot areas. Uh, this planting of trees will be able to reduce the uh, ambient temperature by degrees. And we are also minimizing transportation, making the campus as car-like as possible, and also having green transportation. But these are just brief ideas. Uh, in conclusion, the complexity and comprehensive nature of the UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, require integrated solutions and coordinated actions. Universities clearly have an important role in furthering these goals. And I'm thankful uh, to hear of many of my uh, other panel members speaking about how their university are contributing towards it. Thank you. Thank you, President Tan, for your very nice presentation and sharing your insights in what is happening in, in Singapore. Uh, next, I want to give the floor to Professor Wim de Villiers, uh, Rector and Vice-Chancellor of Stellenbosch University. Professor de Villiers, your, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be interacting with you this morning. What, what a wonderful to hear all these initiatives from around the globe and to interact with uh, university leaders. Um, this is a great opportunity. Thank you to Shejiang University for organizing this very important event. Um, it is uh, sobering to realize that we only have nine years to meet the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. And so that really tells us that the time to think about climate change is over and the time to act is, is now, and because time is actually running out. And that's why uh, university campuses are such great places of, of innovation where we're trying to create spaces where people can come up with solutions to these very complex problems. And, and this is especially true in the times we live in. So I'm Wim de Villiers. I'm the Rector and Vice-Chancellor of Stellenbosch University. Stellenbosch is uh, in South Africa. It's at the southern tip. It's about 50 uh, kilometers or so from, from Cape Town. And one of our uh, uh, core strategic themes is research for impact, because we want to focus on research that really makes a difference in people's lives. So I always talk about research that has a, uh, that's locally relevant, that's regionally impactful, but also globally competitive. So it m must make a difference in people's lives. And we don't just talk about it in, in abstract terms. And we've seen the value of, of this during the current COVID-19 pandemic. We're in the second year of the pandemic. And the research that actually came regarding this from our institution, and we should also apply this approach to climate change. And so there are two things what one can do as a research university. You can produce cutting edge knowledge, and you can put into practice the theory that you generate by actually taking tangible steps on the campus to, climate, to combat climate change. So Stellenbosch University is an example of a university town with about 32,000 students. Uh, two thirds of them are undergraduate, but it's a university town that's actually an example of a, a beautiful example of a, of a micro laboratory in a sense. It reflects the, all the uh, complex challenges that we face in South Africa as well. So I'm going to start with a practical example and just give you one, one example of what we've done at Stellenbosch University. Uh, our Center for Renewable and Sustainable Energy Studies identified installing photovoltaic or PV panels for the generation of electricity as a concrete step that we could take. So then we took one of our largest buildings on campus, the Student Center, to mount these panels and the new PV system was completed in January this year, January 2021. And this will substantially reduce our university's electricity account, but also carbon footprint. Um, it will cut our emissions, carbon emissions significantly over the next period of time. And that's, a, that's an example of what, what we should practice, what we preach. We are thus showing our commitment to creating an environmentally and ecologically sustainable campus and reducing, reaching the goal of reducing our carbon emissions to net zero by 2030 using clean renewable energy. That's the first point. The second point is what about the other role of a university as a 
prime exam function of a research intensive university such as ours, and that is dealing with knowledge production, building purposeful partnerships and inclusive networks. And that is the realization, and as, and, and as we can actually uh, allude, all allude to today, that the importance of, of climate and also climate change and this level of complexity that requires new approaches to build, it, build an understanding of these challenges and how do we develop plans to deal with it. With us. Um, and we need to uh, guide society with respect to sustainable pathways of development, including climate analysis, climate change, and climate-related policy. So on the African continent, Stellenbosch University is actually considered a leader in climate change research or climate studies research. And because of that, we're, we're very uh, happy and grateful to be invited to represent Africa in the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate, or GAUC, in 2019. And flowing from that, where I'm pleased to, to tell you that we're, virt we're about to establish a groundbreaking school for climate studies at Stellenbosch University. And the aim is to create transdisciplinary academic capacity for intellectual and applied synthesis between four things. So it's climate-related knowledge systems that are already present in faculties at Stellenbosch University, but also to integrate the public sector's climate policy and initiatives and the private sector's climate innovation capacity, and then also to couple that to the social impact mission of the university. Because ultimately, the point of this school must be that it should support the transition to a climate resilient society and a low carbon economy in Africa. And its objective is to consolidate, integrate current thinking on climate, particularly in Africa, including climate variability, climate change. It will develop and implement an innovative Africa focused research program that is responsive to climate issues on the continent but also, of course, in relation to the global context. So our goal is for this school to facilitate the transfer of promising know-how and emerging technological inventions that have a broader social impact agenda rather than an agenda that is merely profit-driven or commercially focused. I think the relevant term nowadays is stakeholder capitalism. And to this end, we want to pursue, and that's why I'm so pleased to be part of this discussion, to pursue strategic partnerships and collaborations with researchers and institutions in climate in our region, Southern Africa, on our continent, Africa, but internationally as well. That's why these presentations from my fellow university leaders are so impressive as to what's being done elsewhere uh, globally. So... That's why I'm so pleased to be participating in this, in this initiative so that we can strengthen our ties and work towards common action against climate change. Because the coronavirus pandemic, if nothing at all, has shown us that we can be innovative in, in times of crisis. And, and this is exactly what this moment call, calls for. So this is a call for really for us to go forward uh, together. So thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, uh, Professor de Villiers, and thanks for sharing your insights from Stellenbosch, South Africa. Um, most impressive indeed what's uh, been going on there at this moment. From South Africa, I would like to go to uh, closer by uh, here from the Netherlands, that is to Ghent University, and I want to give the floor to Professor Mieke van Herwegen, and she's Vice Rector of uh, Ghent University. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm really honoured to be to be part of this um, forum and to uh, be able to listen to um, all these esteemed colleagues from all the different universities that are also doing um, incredible things. Um, I'm hoping to be able to share my screen. Let's see whether this works. Oh, yes, it Can works. You see the PowerPoint now. Yep. <laughs> thank you. Um, 
Um, as as uh, was just men mentioned, I am uh, Mieke van Hudewege and I'm uh, Vice Rector of uh, Ghent University. Ghent University is um, a, a university that's uh, about 200 years old now. And um, we're in the middle of Europe in Ghent um, in, um, and we're spread across t town. I mean, it's not really a campus university as you have in some other universities, but we have campus buildings spread across the town, about the 20 different buildings, uh, uh, 20 different campuses across town. We also have campuses in other, in other cities, in Gortrijk, in Bruges, in Ostend, and actually also one overseas in South Korea. We have a, an, an overseas campus. Um, now, we have about 47,000 students, so it's a, it's a fairly big university. And we um, are obviously very much committed to sustainability as well, sustainability at Ghent University. Um, in, in order to uh, be able to, to, to do that, we have a sustainability, a sustainability vision uh, where we want to be a leading knowledge institute for a future that's ecologically, socially and economically sustainable within a local and global context. We feel it's important to actually also state this very firmly and very clearly. Um, and our action plan is based on three pillars. We um, create substantial support for sustainable development. Uh, that's the first one where we really need the support um, uh, from uh, different participants, different stakeholders within the university. It's important to be able to do it together. Um, you can't do it just as policymakers. It's important to get everybody there, everybody um, uh, working with you. We integrate sustain sustainability and education and research. I'll come back to that in a minute. And also in our business operations and, and organization. Um, to follow this up, we have a, a sustainability commission um, to follow up the ambitions. And uh, we have a, a green office where we work together with students and staff um, and initiate the, that, that office. It's, uh, they initiate, initiate and support um, many different types of sustainability projects. Um, they also work out new policy instruments. It usually starts from, from them, bottom up. And that's what we really like. And every two years, we publish a new sustainability report, um, which where our progress is described and new commitments for the coming years are taken. So every two years, um, we've got the sustainability report. You can see it here uh, on, on, on the slide here. There's a link to it for those of you. I don't know whether the slides will be made available to everybody, but there's a link to it so that you can uh, have a look at it afterwards if you're interested in this. Um, now, well, we realize that we need to do more <laughs> than what we have done so far. We've got these plans, we've got different plans, um, but we realize that we need to, to bring them all together to amalgamate all of them in a, in a climate plan, in a bigger climate plan, with uh, short and medium-term objectives. Um, that's what we'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, with also obviously monitoring, and um, if you monitor things from time to time, you need to adjust things as well. So with monitoring and adjustment, and what's extremely important is that we don't want to write these plans from our desks alone. We want to involve experts, policymakers, and committed staff and students. Um, it's only then that we believe that we'll be able to, to transcend business as usual. Um, so this, these combining forces, it's something that I, I, we feel is, is extremely important and that I, I would um, advise all of you to do. It's, it's something that can make a difference. So we're, uh, we need to work. We've decided within this climate plan that we're working on right now, uh, because as I said, we have different uh, plans, deep, more detailed plans with respect to one or two topics, but we're now putting it all together um, within uh, three domains, um, carbon reduction, circular economy, and climate adaptation. Um, and I'll uh, lead you through all of these three in the next few minutes. Um, uh, what we have felt is that it's extremely important to have that point in the future, because from then on, the whole university is speaking the same language and the direction is clear. Um, so from day one, we've made sure that all plans for the new projects, for instance, were adapted to the ambition to build fossil free. So in that respect, I mean, if that's the ambition that you have and that's your plan for the future, that means that we can't make any decisions in the opposite direction anymore. Um, we also know if something doesn't work for, for whatever reason, if something blocks for whatever reason, then it doesn't stop there. Then we may have to take a zigzagging route, but we'll get there. That's why we have these short um, uh, ambitions or short um, goals uh, as well. But the final goal is the point in the future is 2030 uh, in the medium term and then 2050, obviously, in the long term. So... Um, yeah, if you have this type of vision, you know that finally um, you'll get there. But 
yeah, it, it may be difficult to to uh, yeah to find the right path. Now, in terms of uh, the climate plan, as I said, in three domains, the first one, uh, carbon reduction, um, where um, uh, we have we already have an energy plan that was already um, approved by the executive board in um, in 2019. We have a plan of commuting that's already an older one that started in 2015, so it's time to revise that right now. And then we have a, a plan on, on flights because we can see that there's three aspects, energy, commuting, a daily commuting, right? The, the daily work, uh, work um, home commute, um, energy, commuting and flights together, uh, they make up 80% of the carbon footprint of Ghent University. So it's important to work on those three aspects. Now, um, in terms of the energy policy plan, uh, we support the uh, EU ambition to be climate neutral by 2050, obviously, and we've set ourselves specific goals for the period 2020-2030, so the medium term, and that's, you've got the short term, the medium term, the long term, that's, we always think along those lines, um, to reduce total carbon emissions from building heating and electricity by 1.5% per year. As I just mentioned, we have a number of very old buildings, some of them are historical buildings, and it's not always easy to, uh, to go to, uh, to zero emission in, in, in the short run, um, but it's something that in the long term we'll need to be able to do. To reduce energy consumption annually through more efficient use of space and energy, that's also obviously an important part, and then to build and renovate fossil free from now on. So any of the new buildings, any of the renovations will immediately be fossil free. Um, because we can see that the carbon emissions from, from heating and electricity, again, we've made up these, these goals. Um, as you can see, the, the, the first columns of the first bars before the, the pink bar is the situation now. Then between the first two pink bars, we've got the goal for 2030, and where you can see a gradual um, reduction of uh, um, carbon emissions, and then the goal towards 2050. Um, what you can see here is that um, in, in the first um, first area, uh, uh, there were gray gray bars uh, referring to gray what we call gray energy, um, w where in uh, 2009 we decided to only uh, buy electricity from uh, green providers, basically, so electricity from um, windmills, from um, solar solar heating, uh, solar panels, sorry, not solar heating, solar panels, that, that type of thing. Um, so that made an immediate impact, an immediate, very, very big impact, and we're, we're continuing with that. But then we also need to work on uh, gas, uh, gas oil, um, and then the, the, the warmth system, that's uh, the warmth net that we have in Ghent, in order to um, have um, carbon uh, zero carbon emissions by 2050. And then something that we've also done, uh, we're quite proud of, is the fossil divestment. We have decided to disinvest uh, from fossil fuel. So any all of our money <laughs> that Ghent University has um, is not divested in anything that's related to fossil fuel. So moreover, we actively invest in renewable energy and in circular economy. We know that from time to time, the financial um, gain from that will not be as big as if you were to invest somewhere else. But we feel it's very important to walk the talk, and that's a way in which you can walk the talk. Um, secondly, sustainable commuting. Uh, we're hoping for a modal shift um, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, um, transportation as the main route uh, from home to, to work. Uh, here you can see again, uh, we're um, monitoring this. Um, we also have uh, ambitions, ambitions that have been, um, that's to some extent um, we, we got there, but then obviously you can see 2020, yeah, the 2020 ambition with the COVID crisis and people working from home <laughs> that has changed radically. So um, uh, we still need to, to look at what's going to happen there. But what we can see at least is that the use of, of going to work on foot is more or less the same or remains the same, but using the bicycle uh, is something that more and more people do. We, we went from 11% to 27% um, of people using the bike to go to work, and we still need to um, get fewer and fewer people going, uh, taking the car to go to work, but we're working, uh, we're working on that. We are having ambitions in, in that respect as well. Um, and then we, as I said, there's also the sustainable travel policy in terms of flights. Um, we commit ourselves to fly less, to fly more thoughtfully and more sustainably, and to reduce the uh, carbon emissions of, of, of our air travel by at least 27.5%, or um, 
yeah, <laughs> if, if we want to do it better as a knowledge institute in a rich country, we feel that basically we should do more than the required 27.5%. We should do more and we're actually aiming for 46% by 2030 compared to the reference year 2019. To, to that end, we're working on a new academic culture in which short, long distance travel is not considered a necessary success factor for the development of an international network and an academic career. You don't always have to go and fly somewhere uh, else. It's important to collaborate. Obviously, it's very important to collaborate, but we can do a lot uh, as we're doing now uh, virtually as well. If there's one thing that this uh, pandemic has taught us is the fact that we can collaborate uh, from a distance with each other as well. So as an institution, we're also actively participating in the on ongoing international debate on that subject. Um, uh, Ghent University has shifted the default towards sustainable mobility by stimulating sustainable alternatives and avoiding unnecessary travel. And then for necessary air travel, the emitted uh, uh, carbon dioxide is, is partly compensated as well. And then we, we obviously re uh, support research and innovation to make flying gre greener. Uh, we're a knowledge institute, a research institute as well. The second um, domain in the climate plan uh, deals with a circular economy. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, there, again, um, the, the, what we're going to, to uh, address as being part of that plan is working on no disposables in restaurants, in the labs, with respect to events, communication, etc. Uh, with respect to circular buildings, um, a fair and circular ICT, that plan has already been approved by the executive board, uh, was approved in December last year, and with respect to sustainable purchases. So the three other uh, domains are still, we're still working on that, but the fair and circular ICT, we already have uh, an approved plan for that, uh, where new or renewed agreements integrate the best available sustainability criteria. That's um, uh, in, in these agreements, this, the, these criteria are integrated. So social, ecological and economic criteria must be taken into account at all stages of the procurement process uh, when buying uh, ICT materials. Um, we also work towards a maximal extension of life of ICT materials, either through internal processes or in North-South cooperation. Um, all uh, Ghent University ICT materials is recycled in the waste phase. And then we also want to play a social role in making ICT more sustainable and, and we're working on a changing behavior among staff and students. Um, that also seems to be very important with respect to ICT. And then thirdly, with respect to climate, adap climate adaptation, we already have a biodiversity plan that was approved last year. Um, and we're now working on a water plan uh, that will be finished in the next few months. Um, in terms of biodiversity, uh, we preserve and enhance green space and biodiversity and, and we try to achieve progress in both quantity and quality. Uh, the university uses an, a net gain of green space and biodiversity as a starting point. Uh, that means that we preserve the greenery and the biodiversity that, it's pre that is present right now on our sites. As I said, we're spread across town. Some of, some of our, the campuses are actually outside on the outskirts of town as well. And it's a lot greener there. We work on expanding and improving the quality of the greenery on our campuses, and we use green space and biodiversity as a fully-fledged guiding principle in policy decisions. And then finally, um, obviously, uh, we are um, um, a research and teaching and education institute, so sustainability in research and education is a transversal um, um, domain that we also need to work on, also want to work on. So firstly, in terms of research, um, we obviously want to stimulate opportunities for research into a more socially just and ecologically sustainable future without losing sight of the efficient economic system that can be reconciled with this um, ecology economy and, the, and the, the fact that we need to work on both. Uh, such research applies a wide variety of scientific approaches. We believe that um, it has been mentioned before. Um, anything with uh, climate uh, problems, sustainability problems, those are what we call wicked problems. And these wicked problems need to be addressed using multi interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approaches. And um, we also work towards a high societal impact. There are a couple of action points that we have for this year, for instance. 
um, a stimulating research environment based on freedom, trust and talent development. Obviously, that's not just for this year. This is a, a general vision that we have. Um, but we also want to further strengthen these multidisciplinary and in interdisciplinary research projects uh, on sustainability and, and stimulate and support interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research into sustainability issues in, in, in general. And then obviously also the societal valorization of research is also extremely important and also works towards the SDGs. And then in terms of education, uh, we feel that higher education is seen as an important catalyst for sustainable development because of its educational mission. Now we've got about 40,000, actually about 47,000 young people every year right now um, that we can and that we should uh, strengthen um, in terms of the way that we conceive sustainability. And that's why through education, we feel that we need to contribute to a more sustainable society and to make our students sufficiently aware, familiar with the interconnectedness of ecological and social sustainability problems and possible solutions. So um, again, in terms of a number of action points that we set for ourselves for the next few years, uh, is that we embed sustainability projects in our edu general educational policy. Um, we also work towards a substantive integration of sustainability in the criteria. We actually want to make sure that every student, all of our 47,000 students, um, are at some extent, to some extent, are educated within their own domain um, with respect to sustainability. Whether that domain is bioengineering, where it's obvious that you work on such sustainability, but also in psychology, in linguistics, in any other uh, domain that we have that we are teaching at our university, the curricula, um, in the curricula, sustainability needs to be addressed as well. Um, it's a big, big effort that we're making in the, in the next few years. And for that, we also need a professionalization of our lecturers um, towards better courses with a focus on sustainability. And obviously we also support education initiatives by students. So all of that, as I said, is being brought together in this climate plan um, that will be um, finished in the next few months. I think um, we're aiming for uh, before the summer to be able to, to get it all finished so that we can start in the new academic year with this new climate plan. Um, and we feel, it's, as I said, it's, it's important to bring that together in a plan so that everybody knows this is the direction in which we go and that um, you combine forces for that with experts, with policymakers, and then with committed staff and students. If you would like to know a little bit more about this, uh, there is a, a website here uh, that where you can find our sustainability principles um, for Ghent University. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Van Herwege. Thank you for your very interesting exposure of what's going on in Ghent. I must admit, although it's very nearby, I've never been there, but uh, looking forward to seeing things that you've been telling, sharing with us alive. Uh, for our last speaker in this session, um, he will tell Professor Heilan Lian Jen, Vice President of Sejong University, he will share what's going on with uh, respect to gre creating greener campuses in China. And I've had the honor to visit especially the Zhejiang campus in uh, Hangzhou quite a few times myself. So I'm very much forward looking to your presentation. Professor Hei, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So the previous three speakers have told us very inspiring stories about the creation of Green Campus and the setting us good examples. And here I'm going to share with you the effort that is being made here at Zhejiang University with the example of the International Campus. So first of all, as you all know, Zhejiang University has got seven campuses. And the campus that I'll be focusing on is the international campus located in the city of Hainin. And the international campus is a work, inspire, live, and a learn environment for relevant, impactful, import, impactful and exciting in international education and research. And right now, there are about 2,000 students with 161 full-time faculty and staff and 137 adjunct professors from our partner universities. And on the international campus, we have two joint institutes, one with the University of Edinburgh in the UK and the other with the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the United States, focusing on information, biomedical science, and engineering. 
And also we have the uh, joint lab with uh, Imperial College London in data science, and also we have an international business school. The international campus is committed to becoming a sustainable dream campus since the beginning of its planning. We believe that sustainable campus planning and operation is as important as international teaching and learning. As a pioneering endeavor, the international campus will not only play a role in education and academic research, but also in sustainable campus planning and talent cultivation. So this diagram shows the, green, the structure at the university level. So at the university level, we have green campus construction with the vice president of the university serving as the head of the group. So we are creating green campus, offering green education, and also doing green research. And this is the international campus, and I'm going to yeah, tell the story about it. Sharing with you our green goals, green campus, green education, and green research. So in the next five years, the international campus will strive to achieve these goals. And in April 2018, the campus received the China Green Building Design Label. In November 2020, the campus received the Eco Campus Platinum Award. And we are the first university campus in Chinese mainland that has joined the Eco Campus Certification System and been awarded the Platinum Award. In May 2019, the library and the North Teaching Building A of the international campus received the LEED EB Platinum certification with the world's highest score and the third highest score, respectively. The campus has a superb natural environment. The, camp the area to the north and to the south of the campus is wetland parks. So the campus water system is connected with the city water system and the ecological environment is superb. The campus adopts a sponge campus design. All the campus rainwater is collected for storage in the central lake, and the lake water is filtered and used for campus green irrigation. The campus has planned a convenient low carbon pedestrian system with 10 public bicycle rental points connected to 300 other rental points in the city. And the campus uses a variety of low clean energy. Every year, the total amount of renewable energy design approximately is 6.69 million kilowatt per hour. And the campus is equipped with various accessible facilities to create a comfortable and a friendly living environment for teachers, staff, and the faculty. The campus has built a smart campus platform integrating smart security, smart energy, and resources. And the smart campus platform ensures campus safety, energy saving, environmental protection, and low carbon. The campus adopts targeted green campus management and operation measures and the various publicity methods. The residential college is committed to guiding students in exploring green lifestyle and the values, cultivating an awareness of green campus among the students. The Green Ambassador Group has been established on the campus to participate in various activities of the green campus operation. And the International Research Center for Green Building and the Low Carbon City has been introduced. It is committed to the research and technology promotion of green and healthy environmental technology, healthy and public comfortable city climate, new energy buildings, zero energy buildings, smart buildings, and smart cities. And the young scholar of the International Research Center of Advanced Photonics designed a solution method to produce organic light emitting diodes based on low cost, environmentally friendly, and easy to synthesize new organic light emitting molecules. 
So what we will do next? China is committed to peak carbon dioxide emission before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. So as a responsible university, Zhejiang University will always adhere to the concept of sustainable development and is committed to sustainable camp campus operation, sustainable campus community interaction and communication, sustainable education and scientific research, and to build a greener international university community with an open and cooperative attitude. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor He, for your most uh, interesting uh, presentation. And I must say what has been achieved in such a short time at the international campus is indeed truly impressive. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. This brings us to the end of this session. Uh, unfortunately, in view of the time, there is no time left for asking questions. But I think uh, we can ask the organization to moderate that through other channels. For now, I close this session and thank you so much for participating. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arnard, and the panelists for the successful session. So in less than three hours, we try to scratch different aspects of a very broad area of Agenda 2030. And I'd like to ask the audience to join me in thanking all the speakers for their interesting and inspiring presentations. We also feel very grateful to our partners for your strong support, and also thanks to all the participants for joining us today. The forum and the joint statement of global university leaders on the 2030 agenda aim to reaffirm our collective commitment, and we hope they will also be a call for action, inspiring people to think deeper and act together for a sustainable future. I'd like to thank all the participants today for the great presentations, and now my, also my fellow moderators for, the, for your excellent job today. Although the time is a little bit out of time, <laughs> we do not have time for the question, uh, Q&A session. So for those who missed the live streaming of the forum and those who want to watch it again, the video recordings will be available on our website and a social media platform. We will also post on our website the joint statement together with the full list of universities which sign onto it. Uh, so this will conclude our forum today. We look forward to meeting you in person in the near future. Now, may I ask all the participants to turn on your camera? Let's wave to say goodbye. Thank you. Please stay safe and healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. A letter long awaited, upon which dreams are built. 好吧,